Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this LTC 2021. It's a library technology conclave. It was initiated five years back by Informatics, and this year it is fifth in series. As you have seen, the uh, conclave topic is the theme is e science and digital libraries, building communities for collaboration. I welcome all. participants what i mean by participants there are three sets of participants here one those who are registered in this webinar and they got their register uh, the link for joining as a attendee as a audience they are here if they are uh, and their their audio and video will be off there are panelists invited panelists their audio video will be the facility is on in panelists itself there are discussants who will have that privilege of asking the question to the speaker and the speaker is there who can share his screen also we thought of informing you this before starting our webinar uh, there are two three sets of uh, requests i will not say instructions there are requests uh participants who have joined as panelists i request you to keep your videos on during the program till the speaker starts speaking the moment speaker starts speaking you please put off your videos and audios so that there will not be a disturbance is make that your audio is off throughout the session but in panelists there are discussions as well so discussants are requested to have their audio and video on while asking their question only after asking their question you may please put the video and audio off it is just to make sure that the program will be smoothly done please avoid greeting messages in the chat box because it actually distracts the uh, uh, other participants also and the speaker also one set of request is there to all uh, participants who joined as attendee if you have any questions please post it in q and a box if any specific question to that any particular topic is there you may raise your hand the system is providing that facility and if time permit the platform will allow you to ask the question by unmuting yourself please avoid greeting messages in the chat box especially for uh, attendees as a audience to avoid the distraction during the lecture uh, during many many webinars we got many questions like about certificates certificates will be provided to those who will be attending the complete webinar and for that feedback link is not provided this webinar is broadcast live right now on informatics facebook the page is uh, https bit dot ly that is bitly slash informatics fb uh recording of this webinar will be posted on youtube channel of informatics uh, same uh, bitly is there the short url bitly slash ipl youtube so welcome to all of you and over to you mr satyanarayana i'll stop my share good morning friends i have pleasure in welcome welcoming all of you for ltc 2021 the fifth in the series started by informatics 5 years ago i welcome you all the audience i understand there are about uh, 200 plus people who have already joined about about 1000 people who registered there are 300 participants sir and uh, uh, may we have your video please yeah. so i have the video on all right yeah now it is there yeah thank you okay so uh, once again i welcome you all to this occasion of curtain riser webinar what we call 
due to the COVID scenario, we decided to sequence the program over a period of time with several pre-conclave and uh, finally the conclave program to be hosted in January. So that's why we called it a curtain riser webinar. This webinar series lecture is on e-science and fourth paradigm in research. We have in this audience several invitees and our uh, guest invitees as speakers. Friends, I would like to introduce you, our speakers first. You know, it's today, we are all stuck with, possibly lost with uh, the COVID. However, there is a, an entirely different challenge also the country is facing in terms of uh, health and infections. The country struggles with malaria, which continues with an astounding number of over 20 lakhs cases of TB. I understand about lakhs of people, almost about 24 lakhs last year, succumbed to death with TB, making it the leading cause in India for those particularly in the prime age of 15 to 45 year old. Most victims are poor. And you know, pharma companies have very little incentive to develop new drugs. For TB. Although Indian government has a big incentive to reduce the disease burden. In this scenario, in 2012, one gentleman seriously thought about a change in this area, bring about a transformational change in this area, and launched a revolution which is called OSDD, Open Science drug discovery network and you would be surprised today there are more than 5000 people who joined this network which is modeled on a wikipedia model providing information leading to discovery of new drugs on this particular disease from the biology of this, this drug to the pharmacology and drug discovery and this person is a great scientist of our country today who is going to deliver our uh, curtain rising curtain riser lecture professor samir brahmachari i welcome you professor brahmachari for uh, this for this program and uh, we are greatly honored for uh, you accepting our invitation to briefly introduce you to uh, Dr. Brahmachari, he's a great scientist of our, our time. I can say, you know, he's a great scientist of uh, global fame and influence, a shining star in the club of leading scientists of India. The likes of uh, CNR Rao, GN Ramachandran, Mashalka, Balram and the likes. You know, scientists know him as biophysicist. He's an information scientist of different kind, which should be of interest to a large part of our audience. He specializes in what I would say, organizing an entirely different kind of libraries. It's about decoding and encoding the evolution of human civilization, which is genomics. And he is a computational biologist, or we can call him a bioinformatician. Professor Brahmachari's journey started from Calcutta, where he did his uh, graduation and post-graduation. And uh, from there, he landed in Bangalore at uh, our famous Indian Institute of Science. And from there to Paris to do his uh, postdoctoral after his uh, doctorate in IAC. And uh, he also went to G Max Planck Institute, Germany, and his journey continued all over the world 
during his career. And finally, he landed in New Delhi as the Director General of CSIR uh, in 2007. He's a great institution builder. And uh, uh, the, in fact, there's an interesting connect uh, of Professor Brahmachari's many several initiatives with our conclave. In Bangalore, you must be knowing that there was an institute called Center for Cellular, sorry, uh, uh, Center for uh, Mathematical Modeling and uh, uh, Simulation, uh, which during his time, he converted into he, a full-fledged CSIR Institute called, named it as CSIR Fourth Paradigm Institute. As you will hear him, e-science is all about, uh, in some way, a fourth paradigm in research. He created many new institutions during his uh, time at CSIR. And as I already told you, he is the hero of the world in the open source discovery. So much so, he was awarded so much so he was awarded, uh, you know, he was hailed as open source guru in biotech by the famous science magazine published by American Association for the Advancement of Science. He has several awards and recognitions, I would say countless. I almost counted more than 25 of them in his list. And, uh, any award that you name, the national award he has received, like the Bhatnagar Award. He's a fellow of all the three national academies of uh, science in India. He's a fellow of the Third World Academy. And uh, he's rated as the world's top 10 biotech techies in 2012 by uh, FS Biotech IT Magazine. And what is very appealing about Professor Brahmachari is his uh, concern for taking science to the masses in which area he did tremendous work during, particularly during his career at the CSIR as DG. And that work, his incessant effort continues where, as I said earlier, he is considered globally as the hero of open source drug discovery. We are highly thankful to you, Professor Brahmachari, and uh, we are uh, we welcome you again, friends. Today we have another eminent scientist, uh, Dr. Uh, Vidyadhar Muzkavi, who is uh, from uh, uh, an outstanding scientist in aerospace science and heading uh, CSIR Fourth Paradigm Institute who are also our program partner in the LTC 2021. Dr. Vidyadhar Mutkavi uh, started his, uh, uh, you know, his uh, uh, studies with IIT Kanpur. He secured his B.Tech in IIT Kanpur and his journey continued to do his uh, M.Tech in IASC and later he did his uh, PhD in Caltech and his specialization and contributions are in the area of modeling and simulation, atmospheric flow, flight-related activities, and particularly high-performance computing. Uh, we are particularly happy that uh, Professor Brahmachar, sorry, Professor uh, Muzukavi is chairing this uh, session today. As I told you earlier, that uh, uh, his institute is closely connected with the theme of the seminar. Once again, I invite you, Professor uh, Mudkavi, and thank you for uh, chairing, agreeing to chair the session of the day. I would like to profusely thank our uh, three uh, partner institutions who joined us in this conclave, the National Institute of Advanced Studies, Bangalore. In fact, this program was supposed to have been organized in the uh, NIAS uh, auditorium which, as you know, due to the COVID situation, could not be organized in a physical way. Uh, Dr. Sai Baba, uh, the scientist there, and his colleagues are here attending this. Uh, and uh, I thank Nias 
Rajiv Gandhi University of Health Sciences, Bangalore. Uh, in fact, Dr. Uh, Sachidanand, the Vice Chancellor of the University, was uh, supposed to join, and he couldn't join due to uh, some urgent work, emergency work, since he's particularly in charge of uh, managing the COVID scenario in Karnataka. And uh, uh, so, and CSIR Fourth Paradigm Institute, I mentioned already. Thank you, partners. On this occasion, I must say a few words about uh, informatics. Uh, uh, without taking much of time, I would like to present a two minutes video on informatics, uh, which informatics has been in the past 40 years, uh, uh, doing the service to the nation and the world by carving uh, its own passage to knowledge benefiting millions of uh, scientists and researchers in the world. 40 years ago, when information was scarce and online was unheard of, informatics was envisioned with a digital vision by an entrepreneur working as a librarian then to bridge the global information access gap in the country. This pioneering vision is a global company today with products and services benefiting millions of users in the academic, research and corporate segments around the world. India Today magazine described the venture as the first online information company in India for global knowledge access. Serving global information companies on a project for supplying consolidated Indian business information helped Informatics to ideate its first digital information product named India Business Insight, IBI. Credited with the enviable reputation as the pioneers in the online and CD-ROM based information business in India, Informatics started creating new digital information products through 1990s. Neuromed on CD, a product initiative funded by Limhans Bangalore, was the earliest e-journal archive in India for Indian medical journals. Driven by the internet advantage, Informatics developed its first global information product named JGate. JGate is truly the world's largest database for journal literature by its coverage of over 50,000 journals. The journey has continued with a diverse portfolio of products and services evolving across four business units, information products, digital library solutions, enterprise content management and publishing. The product family of informatics is a growing list with innovation driven by the latest in technology and evolving market needs. In an industry where content is the king and technology is the master, Informatics has been a proud pioneer and leading player. Gaining 40 years of insightful experience by 2020, Informatics continues to be driven by values with a passion to deliver excellence. So I thank you all once again and I now request Dr. Mudukavi to uh, take over the chair and uh, conduct the pro uh, proceedings of the day. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Satya. Uh, am I audible? Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah. Uh, good morning to everybody and welcome to this uh, inaugural uh, session in the Carlton Trades Lecture by Professor Bhumachari. Uh, it's my pleasure to invite Dr. Shalini to just give a briefing on the event which is unfolding before you. Dr. Shalini, please. Thank you, Professor Mukavi. Thank you, uh, Satya. Uh, welcome to you all uh, for this curtain raiser event, which is the first event of the LTC 2021. I want to talk to you about the whole program of LTC 2021. Uh, uh, is my screen visible? My slide? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yes. Thank you. So uh, as uh, Satya and Devendra mentioned, this is the fifth in the series, LTC 2020 was supposed to be. In fact, uh, last year, sometime end of last year, that is 2019, uh, Satya and I, we were discussing, when Satya asked me to actually put up a, put together a program for the LTC 2020. 
we chose the theme of e-science and digital libraries. In a way, I would say the theme e-science has proven to be prescient because at that time, we had no idea about this COVID scenario. So we thought e-science or science and digital libraries is one of the topics that we should be focusing on. But today, when you look at the COVID, post-COVID, I mean, I think we have not yet reached the post-COVID scenario. COVID has brought science and the society together. In one sense, there are tensions. People are not able to understand, or rather I would say, they even have suspicions about the science with all that that is going on, whether it is the COVID itself, whether how it spreads, what is the vaccine scenario, et cetera, et cetera. There is suspicion. There are people who are actually doubting the science itself or the scientific community. But at the same time, I would also say that it has brought together science and society together and closer in a way which we had not imagined in the last couple of decades, I would say. The reason being, just think of one scenario. I'm sure all of you have heard of Dr. Fauci, right? And in pre-COVID, nobody would have remembered who is the advisor to the US president. For all the controversy regarding that, everybody today knows and waits for what Dr. Fauci talks about the COVID scenario. That is in one sense, as I said, the good, bad, and the ugly of COVID with reference to science and the society. So in a way, as I said, it, was, it has proven to be prescient and it's good that we are talking about e-science and digital libraries for the LTC 2021. We had to move this conference from 2020 to 2021, primarily because of the COVID uh, scenario. Now, coming to the theme of this conference, e-science. I just take, indulge me in allow me to talk a little bit about e-science because sometimes, you know, we all know that we have an idea about what is this and each one of us carry with us a different view of what is e-science. From our perspective, we look at e-science as where data science meet science. I'm reminded of a very well-known incidence of one famous physicist, Richard Feynman, in 1964 at a lecture in Cornell. He said about scientific method, he was explaining the scientific method. He said, first you guess, then you compute the consequences of your guess. Then you compare those consequences with the evidence from observations or experiments. If your guess disagrees with the experiments or the observations, it is wrong. I think this simple statement by Professor Physicist Richard Feynman captures the essence of science or the key to science. That is what science is all about, right? It makes no difference between X or Y, you or me, who makes that guess, how beautiful that guess is, or how smart you are, whether you are a professor at Cornell or a professor at Mysore, it doesn't matter who you are, whose name it is. If it is wrong, it is wrong. Of course, this is based on the idea that it's all based on scientific method, based on the data. But then we also know that data could be wrong, or rather the way we see data could be wrong. So in one sense, e-science is about where you bring the data to science in such a way that you minimize the wrong. E-science is a term, in fact, it was created by John Taylor, the then Director General of Office of Science and Technology UK in 1999 to actually spawn a new wave of research funding by the UK government. And later on, this was picked up. And then IEEE has been conducting a series of conferences. I think now is the 15th conference on e-science. And it defines e-science as something that studies, enacts, and improves the ongoing process of innovation 
in computationally intensive or data intensive research methods. Along with this e-science by the UK government as well as IEEE picking up, there was another stream that was by Jim Gray of Microsoft Research then, who actually coined the term fourth paradigm. And there was in fact, he brought out a book and he defined, he was looking at it from the computer science or the data sciences perspective. And he called fourth paradigm as experimental, theoretical and computational science are all being affected by this data deluge. And that is why the fourth or the data intensive science paradigm is now emerging. That is what he said uh, somewhere about, let us say about 15 years back roughly. And the book was also brought out in 2009. In fact, in 2019, a decade after the fourth paradigm was also discussed and brought out. Now, when we talk about this paradigm or the fourth paradigm, in fact, the person who popularized this concept of scientific paradigm or paradigm itself was Thomas Kuhn, the famous philosopher, science philosopher, who actually, for the first time, studied the data and based on historical evidence in science, says that contrary to the general expectations that, you know, as we all use, scientists stand on the shoulders of giant, which is a famous quote by, as you all know, Newton, that every change is not necessarily aggregative. Sometimes these changes happen in a way that it revolutionizes or completely changes the view that is held in that particular uh, discipline or in the sciences itself. So he wrote this book, that is Thomas Kuhn wrote this book, Copernican uh, Revolution in 1957, wherein he was actually laying the ground for his, the second book, which he called it as the Structure of Scientific Revolutions, which was published in 1962, which is actually a classic, continues to be a classic, because we are still seeing the, you know, the effect of this, because we are observing how paradigm changes or paradigmatic shifts changes. Now, coming to this e-science, data sciences meets science, again, we don't have to go or look only in the last 10 or 20 years. One important, uh, I would say, the forgotten reality of science history is like Obrahe's assistant, Joe Kepler. All of us know about Kepler, but not many people know about actually his mentor, Brahe, because he was the one who had collected humongous amount of astronomical observations and prepared this catalog of all his observations. But it was Kepler who used this data and brought about the planetary motion theory. The point that I'm trying to make here is that it is this one instant which highlights the division between mining and analysis of captured and carefully archived experimental data and the creation of theories. And that is actually the e-science or that is actually the fourth paradigm that we are talking about and this that we want to focus on in this conference. That is the theme of the conference. So the theme of the conference is e-science and digital libraries. Because we believe, I come from the field of digital libraries, information management, etc. And we, we have observed that there are many common elements of information management infrastructure between e-science and the digital libraries. And therefore, we thought it's good to bring these two together, these two communities together, so that we can perhaps minimize the kind of you know mismatch that happens, the kind of discovery that may not happen, primarily because of the uh, gap between the data and then the scientific discovery. So our aim here at LTC 2021 is to focus and champion the cause of e-science in India. We believe that it needs to be further strengthened in India and bring experts across the disciplines of sciences and data information sciences on a common forum. And of course, our primary objective is to build a community for collaborative research so that, as I mentioned earlier, we are part of creating the cyber infrastructure and also develop tools for data capture, data analysis, and et cetera, and so that we can foster new discoveries. So given this theme of the conference, the conference itself has six thematic uh, sessions. The first one is the fourth paradigm in research. The second one is cyber infrastructure and big data analytics. Third one is open science and scholarly communication. Again, we can go back to 
what happened with uh, uh, COVID, the two articles that were published in Lancet and you know New England Journal of uh, Medicine about the uh, me medicines are, uh, for drug for the uh, COVID and how uh, the data was actually wrong. All of those things given give us an idea about why science and science data has to be as open as possible and why we need to manage this data properly. That's the topic of the third and the fourth session, open science and scholarly communication, research data management. And of course, naturally in this era and our post COVID era of, uh, we have to focus on the health informatics. And given the fact that, you know, today social media is not only taking over, not just the politics, whether it is the elections, US elections or Indian elections or what have you, it is also actually influencing scientific research because the data that comes out of the social media is very useful for scientific. When we say scientific research, we include social sciences as well. So social scientific, uh, social sciences and scientific uh, research. You might have heard of you know, how famous scientists are actually using uh, various kinds of data. I mean, medical data also that is available in the form of tweets, et cetera, to actually further the cause of the research. So these are the six, I would say, themes that we are going to focus on. And then before the actual conclave in January 2021, given the nature of the online nature of the conference, we thought it is good to have some pre-conclave programs. So we have three special lectures. The first one, the curtain riser one that is happening today. And the second one will be on November 27th. And third one will be on December 20th, uh, sorry, December 7th. And we are also going to have two workshops that is in January. So these precede the actual conclave. Now, the second lecture that is November 27th is going to be given by Professor Prasenjit Mitra of the Penn State College of Information Sciences and Technology, who is a computer scientist who has worked in the area of digital libraries, information sciences, and information retrieval and management who's going to bring the perspective of digital libraries to the forum, because today we are going to get uh, an overview of the e-science perspective, the fourth paradigm perspective from Professor Brahmachari, the first lecture. The second component of the theme that is a digital library, is the overview of that will be provided by Prasenjit Mitra on November 27th. Then the third special lecture is a special lecture itself, that is the 17th annual lecture on informatics by, I'm suppo I suppose everyone is very familiar with the famous Professor Jain Kharitsa, who is famous for all his contributions also, as well as many awards and Infosys award as well. He's going to talk about data science, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Then we are going to have the conclave program that is the conclave program will be on day one. Uh, we are going to inaugurate the conference uh, we are waiting for confirmation from Professor Vijay Raghavan to inaugurate the inaugural session. It will be, we hope to be inaugurated, uh, to be inaugurated by Vijay Raghavan. But we already have, I'm very happy to share with you that Professor Tony Hay, who is considered as the father of e-science in the world, he is going to be giving the keynote address during the conclave inaugural session. So he has already confirmed. So we are in touch with him. He will be giving conclave address. And then we are also going to have the workshop, which I mentioned. Uh, the first workshop will be on January 7th. That will be provided by Dr. Mandar Mutalik Desai, who is with IBM on AI for eScience. The second, lecture, second workshop on ontology for data management by Andrew Taylor, who is with the, who is the director of platforms and software with the Australian Research Data Commons. Now, conclave program itself, after the inaugural session, you will see that uh, we have all these sessions, so day two, day three, and day four, they cover the various thematic sessions of the conference. Coming to today's uh, session, cut and a lecture, Satya has already mentioned about this lecture. I will just mention that we have come up with an innovative format for given the online nature of the uh, program, come up with an innovative format for the lecture itself. We have identified some 11 scientists, young researchers who are going to ask questions, who are going to 
uh, his role is as a discussant, they will be asking questions. And these are our discussants, Professor Narahari Shastri, Professor Anjan Ray, Professor Chandrasekhar, and Satyan, uh, Sayantan Majumdar, Mandar Mutalik Desai, Muvendan, Nandini, Sheshadri, Manish Kesavani, Mahit Bhakti, and Jaiti Deshma. Welcome to all of the discussants to this uh, program. And now I end and then enjoy the lecture. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Shalini. Uh, it's now my pleasure. Uh, I'm quite sure Professor uh, Brahmachari has been waiting for a while. Uh, we are a little delayed. Uh, I couldn't think of anybody uh, in the world today who is actually living through the fourth paradigm. He started the fourth paradigm institute, and it is actually the first institute in the world. He used to say that, and then you know that, of course, chronologically that's correct. And we are eager to hear Professor Brahmachari on the e-science, which he not just uh, he conceptualized the institution, but he has lived through it. And a lot of his uh, presentation will actually cover uh, grounds in this area, which he himself has you know, involved and done a lot of work. It's a pleasure, Dr. Brahmachari, to invite you to present your uh, lecture uh, on the e-science. Uh, I will be assisting you in uh, moving the slides. Professor Brahmachari, please. Thank you, Dr. Mutkavi, for inviting me. Uh, Mr. Satyanarayana, Dr. Shalini, uh, for organizing this. And to all the distinguished participants, and I can see Anjan Ray, uh, Dr. Narahari Shastri, several of you, and the uh, distinguished panelists. You know, as per the program, I have exactly one minute. Uh, <laughs> no, no. You will have, 40, have, you'll have at least 40 minutes. <laughs> you will so have at least 40 I can, minutes. <laughs> I can very happily say we can start the discussion and question and answer, but it would be appropriate. So let us have the first slide, please. Yeah. And is okay. it possible yeah. to have one person face, your face or somebody's face on the screen, or it is not possible? When you put the screen. I think you should be able to see the faces, I think, right? Okay. I'll come right. on my other thing. Yeah. I'll share the screen now. Mm. You able to see the screen now? Yeah, I can see the screen. Okay. Okay. Uh, and thank you. In that, you can see some of the faces? I can see your face. So one is enough. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> The most difficulty is to tip talk without seeing anybody's face. Yeah, I, I think you probably can also uh, enable a few more panel this things on your this thing. It doesn't matter. You can go ahead. Okay. And can, yeah, yeah. No, I, I can see there is some alike person around me. <laughs> uh, you know, I wish I heard Shalini uh, earlier. I might have reorganized my lecture a little bit. Uh, the idea is, you know, I I. As a child, I was interested in numbers and maths. We used to have games with my eldest brother, who was 14 years older, playing with numbers. And you will be surprised, as early as 1968 election in West Bengal, I used to go to the information library to collect all past election results to predict what would be the election outcome. So my interest in data was always there, and I have been so the interesting part of it, I landed up at the University of Science. I just want to tell Dr. Shalini, when you are talking about UK, I must tell you, in Bangalore, Dr. G. N. Ramachandran established a unit in 1971 where only data was the process and analyzing and computation is the only way that started. And the biophysics, molecular biophysics unit, is the first where I was very lucky to arrive. So, you know, in I think uh, <clears throat> the fourth paradigm book back, if you read, you will realize uh, it's not the data scientists are not the smartest, they're in the right time, arrived there. So you are there and I arrived in the right data and places. And, in for, and interestingly, <clears throat> those are the days when first round of crystal structures and information were coming around or protein, Peptide crystal structures were there, and Ramachandran and Shashi Shekharan were both Kunian scientists. Philosophically, they were Kunian, deep 
use of information, building models, revising models, and that's what the environment was. Here I came in to do experimental work, and you will be surprised, I can tell this, I take a lot of pride when telling my students that using this available data, I could propose why a, a particular amino acid gets hydroxylated in collagen and gives triphthalical structure, and I could publish that as a hypothesis based on only data in 1978 in the PNAS. So that brought me from continuously, I realized that the data and experiment goes together. And that's how my journey was. So until the Human Genome Project came, which became the largest data, at, I was lucky to become faculty member at the age of 28 at the University of Science same molecular biophysics unit from where I moved to Delhi in 1997 as a professor. And then I got started the Institute of Genomics. So you can see my beginning of interest in data was in Bangalore. And I realized the business people were handling data, even informatics was handling business data. Science data was much later. Bioinformatics came in Bangalore in 1986. The, that was first in the world, actually a bioinformatics center to be built. So therefore, <clears throat> history of data is quite common with India. You know, keeping our horoscope is common. Looking at data. If you look at science, physics, astrophysics, astronomy is the where the first large data came. And Indians use those data to build uh, opportunity possibilities of predictions. So therefore in science, it is the large data came much before the fourth paradigm book was written. Okay. Human genome sequence was the first large scale data and protein database is the last scale data that biology started looking at. Today we have a huge data and that data with which people are analyzing and trying to understand. So what I will try to do today in my slides, through, through my slides, also you can ignore some of the big facts, just take the theme of it. How in India, how in India we have taken forward this data science and how connecting data science in scientists with biologists and domain expertise is a key factor of success in the fourth paradigm. Next slide, please. So we are talking about big data. And big data starts with astrophysics. And you can see it needs a lot of connectivity. Today you can say cloud, but there was no cloud. There was a CD-ROM. You saw the tele uh, movie. So people were handling, you know, I had downloaded in five and a quarter inch floppy at Bangalore, the first is chromosome three data, okay? And I will be surprised when I gave my leaving my IGIB lecture, I had that box. Students were so excited to take five and a quarter inch floppy having each chromosome data. It was laughing, you know, it was very. So therefore, today we, I'm sure Narohari Shastri will realize that we have gone through a generation of one calculator to all the way today in cloud computing and whatnot we are doing. So, in, you know, I'm lucky that I have traversed through this route. I'm lucky that human genome sequence information and became Hugo member in 1990. So I have lived through this big data explosion of the biology and I'm very fortunate. So it's not that you are the smartest or visionary, you actually are lucky that you were exactly there at that time. Next slide. Next. This book, this book came to my hand, previous one. This fourth paradigm book came to my hand uh, in, in 2009. And I suddenly realized I was only busy with biology. I suddenly realized it's much beyond biology. We, and being a DGCSIR, I, I realized that we needed an institute. And that time CMAX was there. Next slide. <clears throat> so, I felt that CMAX, which is a third paradigm institute, it was involved in simulating complex phenomena, including weather prediction to rocket or anything else. 
First paradigm, of course, you understand the empirical. Second paradigm is theoretical. So, and fourth paradigm is actually an integrating of data intensive scientific discovery, connecting all possible experimental theoretical data. Next slide. So fourth paradigm institute was born with an idea that it should be able to do every aspects of data intensive scientific discovery. And it is CMAX being an autonomous entity within the CSR family could be connected to everybody. And that's how it was built. I'm glad that Dr. Mutkavi is leading it. And I think 2011, it was ahead of time. It was ahead of time. And uh, many of my colleagues didn't understand it. People had a doubt, what is this fourth paradigm in 2010? And big data was still not a fashion. Today it is. So, you know, taking from art science, health and well-being, brain mapping is the computer network. You know, why brain map and computer? Because that will teach us new generation computers, right? Social media analytics for personalized marketing to election outcome. And, you know, you can see how yesterday uh, Trump's election prediction of Biden winning Pennsylvania when there was a half a million difference was all analytics, was looking at analytics. Human behavior modeling, you know, today we are influenced by social media. We are influenced by the big data analytics of Google and then influencing us. Development of new learning models. You know, who should learn what? Can we come up with data analytics? Next slide, please. So I will cover with genomics and big data and tell you in healthcare, that's what I will focus today and see how big data actually goes. Uh, I am not going to cover open source drug discovery. You know, it's already been talked about. I just wanted to tell that next slide. <clears throat> you know, biology was exploding in 2001, 2003 with large amount of information. And 2002, CSI supported a project called In Silico Biology for drug discovery, you know. And that was the first of its kind where we brought large number of computational biologists bioinformaticians in the whole CSR family and put them together to build. And I think in CSR system uh, during Mashelka's time, that must have been one of the largest projects, nearing 50 crores, and one of the largest outcome projects. You know, uh, it is it's very rarely we recognize our scientist contribution. Uh, we often look at waste, but this was one of the phenomenal, and I can tell you Dr. GPS Raghav is world one of the most cited, you know, uh, websites, you know, web servers, his web servers gets uh, 1 lakh 50,000 hits per day. And today he is the professor on triple IT, but he has been the pioneer of our uh, in silico biology projects, which eventually formed into an open source drug discovery. So Sidney Brenner said, very little credit goes in actually integrating and assimilating this information. You know, this is what, next slide. So biologists using high, high performance computing with the molecular dynamics, next generation sequencing, high throughput data, mass spectra, and again, large databases, next. <clears throat> but it needed, in 2005, in my lecture in Hugo in Japan, I was the chair of the informatics, so I mentioned that we need to create a system biology understanding, but you need all these components together. But just imagine you having a department at the University of Science with all these people together, I don't know who will be the chairman. And how do you build an institute? And I'm very proud to say CSIR IGIB has 80% of this into one building within 40, 45, 50 faculties. But the rest of it, we are connected. Like we are connected to four paradigm institute. We are connected to medical hospitals. So it's a large network of network that we have built in order to handle a complex problems. Next slide. So, <coughs> so what is the role of the data? Is to decoding ourselves and digital health. And this is the new opportunity. Understanding genome, big data. Single cell genomics, bigger data. Biological regulation network, too complex data. How, how COVID 
is it affecting somebody's diarrhea, somebody's kidney, somebody's blood clotting? It's, it's too complex. It's an extraordinarily complex data set. Just imagine if you have every patient's phenotype, every patient's biological biochemical information, every patient's status of antibody and their antigen value, just imagine what a massive data set that will be to understand. And we know we have to appreciate that in 200 days, how much science has happened on COVID from discovery to sequencing to do all this has happened, you know, such a short time. So then I'm sure the biggest challenge will be of the next generation is the brain mapping, super complex information, traffic data, biological image analysis, which is already happening. It's a mega data. Digitization will be a complete game changer and application AI to healthcare. And I don't know how many of you know, there are only 26 AI-based diagnostics, which has been approved by FDA. Next slide. <clears throat> Brain mapping project will tell us, very, it's a very complex, trillions of network images are being processed. Next. <clears throat> so this is a collaborative network in 2013. I'm glad to say that open source drug discovery was initiated in 2007. And that is the world's first large collective effort, science, where 8,700 scientists from 130 countries participated. And that also led to hundreds of publications and some of the molecules has gone. And today you can see COVID is an open source drug discovery movement. You know, I, I, will, I just have a meeting yesterday with, in England, somebody wants to do funding for open source. And previously week, I had discussions with the global team of 70. We published a paper, how healthcare should become open source. So open source, the discovery movement, although initiated at India, is actually now a global phenomena. And I think my job is done. Next slide. <clears throat> Just to show you one example, artificial intelligence-based drug discovery. It takes 13 years, $2 billion. Recently, in only 18 million euro, but on 21 days, drug was identified for this fibrosis. And in 46 days, it was tested. And this is the future. And I can guarantee you, whenever anybody asks me vaccine, I tell, don't worry, drugs will come. AI-based drug finding discovery for COVID will be there by early next year. So therefore, Drugs will be there. Once drugs is there, you don't worry about so much of the disease. Next slide. So what is that happens? What does the AI do? It is data-driven. Complex algorithm and machine learning used to extract meaningful information, identify compounds from billions of compounds libraries, and the information that we have. I wish we could collect all the failure experiment information, which is not there. Presently, it is the repurposed drugs which are being used for COVID and new diseases. I hope in soon you will have new molecules that will come up through. Next slide. This is India's first effort to do, to just press once more. It is the, in, this is the first effort of India to map genomics for the entire population of India, 55 population. We started in 2002, the CSR at CSR IGIB as a leader. But I must tell, I am very proud to say, 158 authors, two papers we published this work. And this is not easy. It's not easy to coordinate with 24 PI in national, in India and with 76 students. And we had 100 papers, 100 papers on this, but I have been author of only few because I always believe that if you want to achieve something large and collaborative, you should reduce your own visibility in the system. But what we could demonstrate by this, that the Indian genetic, we have a mixture of all from Chinese and Chinese, Japanese to European and African, entire Dravid population, five population. Next slide. Now this allowed us to map the malarial risk map, which is in the left side on the top, right side at the bottom, you can see we mapped, we also mapped the uh, risk of the falciparum, upper right. And you can see there's a match of the genomic risk 
and actual disease. And this we used to understand COVID. And you can see, next slide. And we are very proud to say, in, we do a science, often your science doesn't go into a national museum. And Indian Gen Landscape of Genetic Material is in Calcutta National Museum in the anthropology last panel. And it is very proud moment when I saw that uh, along with my daughter-in-law. So that was a very impressive environment. You can understand that if the science that you have done is in the National Museum. Next slide. But how did you use this? So this is my next students and generation has taken it further in CSI family to do 1000 full genome sequence. Next slide. <clears throat> and this is Pan India. 1000 samples are actually sequenced, 1008. I don't know why 1008, 108 I understand, <laughs> right? I am one of them and I, next slide. And I carry this card uh, of my genome with me and it is all digital, protected digitally. So you have to show, present the card and then you can go to the server and, and doctor can see what are your risk of various diseases. So this is happening in India. And that's what I wanted to tell. It's not a Western. This is the first of its kind in the world happening in India by young people who have not traveled abroad. Next slide. So what do we do? We use this map of the, next slide. You press it again, you will see. Now we use this right side. We identify gene which has whose prevalence decides malaria. Next slide. And now we overlay this is the paper published. Next slide. Press again. Huh. This is then we overlaid COVID-19 question. I asked the question, go, go back, go back. Uh, I asked the question, why Eastern India has less death in COVID, whereas Western India had far more incidents and death. And this clearly explains that if you have this gene alleles in two genes, SCE and this uh, APOEB, actually you have a protection and Eastern India has the protection versus others. When this was, this is published in current science now, and this is not a hypothesis. Then we use the data, which already we had. And best, and China has a huge allele, this allele in whole population. So actually China gets protected. Next slide. And then when you look at the whole world, you know, right side, you up, you see the malaria risk. You can see there's no malaria, North America, Africa, and, and Russia and all, and look at the COVID. So where there is less of malaria, there's higher of COVID-19. So this is data intensive discovery. This is nothing, uh, no, no great research. A new experiment had to be done. Next slide. So the next question is, are we, next question we asked uh, is, is in, in, is in India, uh, we have become, the, the virus is becoming more lethal or more benign? You can see the red and the green ones are very little. In the beginning, between December and June, it was very high. And it is, you can see, it's a collaborative effort of CSIR and other institution. And next slide will tell you from June to October, next slide, this green and red has vanished. Now, what does it mean? The, the virus has become less lethal, but more infective. The blue one is more infective, but less lethal. And this is what we are seeing. So you can see how beautifully genomics power that we built and institutions and the capability is utilized today. So I always say, don't expect 200 days science has happened without 20 years of investment and vision. So 200 days of science, we could do this to show India that don't worry, death will not happen. India can be open, the economy can be open. And you see, these are political decision, policy decisions based on data. Next slide. And you can see this is state-wise. You can see how the red and green has decreased and more blue has come as a function of time. So you can say, you don't have to worry. Wherever there are green and red, you have to be, green is not a problem, red is a problem. So wherever there is a red, still you have to worry, how do we reduce that regions? Next slide. Now, is it for only for high science and high policy or it can be reached the poor? So I realize, we realize that as a DG, that we really don't have data for rural India. Next slide. <clears throat> so can we improve? 
the quality. So I'll give you examples how IT portal captures GPMS portal with which 4PI is involved, how big data analytics is done, how quality improvement can be done, and how startups, and that's all will be my talk next few minutes. Next slide. So Access at the International, where I was advisor, we looked at the birth and this for uh, Telangana, next slide, and Andhra Pradesh. And we looked at it as pilot scale, at least about 50 hospitals and systems to see how we can capture the data. The data was captured, next slide. And based on this data, you know, normally a patient comes, a, a sepsis, a child, childbirth, then we lose the data. Everything is in paper prescription. Then you never can read it. So you can see the moment we digitize data capture, improve efficiency, data visibility, and then data unavailable for analytics and interoperability. This becomes very important for the data scientists to understand. And we applied this, next slide. And with this, we could actually improve availability and use of data, bring in the quality call to drive quality, and then decide policies and impanel hospitals who has actually better quality. And this data today, you will be very happy to note, next slide, is sitting in the fourth paradigm cloud with the help of uh, Indian C Center for Social Transformation with whom I am associated. Next slide. But you know, you can't leave everything. So therefore we wanted to capture the Karnataka data. And this is the Karnataka data. Again, it is with four paradigm and for TB compliance, because as he said that there is 1 million TB patients we miss, we don't even capture. And our death is about thousand patients die every day. Next slide. I just want to show this slide that this is not possible to do by informatics. We need Dr. Mutkavi for the cloud analytics. We need Dr. Uh, <coughs> Top Pritesh, who is an AI expert. We need an IT professionals. Then we need the medical people. So we had a whole team that need to look at uh, data. So therefore it is important to bring in, not only data scientists can do this problem, but next slide, to bring in people together. So, you know, if this today we can do a single cloud computing interface. Next slide. And it can actually monitoring funding survey of online Karnataka TV compliance. I hope if we can keep doing this every, every continuously, COVID time has a problem. TV got neglected significantly. So we should be able to eliminate in 2030 the TV from at least from Karnataka. Next slide. So it's a game changer. And can we lead it? Where are the signs that India can become a leader and not a follower? So I'll give you first of his kind examples, which will help you. Next slide. So data-driven decision-making in healthcare is the future. And every decision needs to be followed. Outcome will be data for the next decision. And changing mindset is the biggest challenge. How do you make a medical practitioner believe in data scientist? And how do you data scientist learn medical words and understand how data is captured? You know, I had a privilege to work with the first Ayurveda company, Jiva, which collected digital data over millions of patients. And I actually, we were the first to analyze 657,000 data, I won't present it. And that became the first published record of a digital data in the world of Ayurveda. And we can know now what actually works and what doesn't work. Next slide. You know, if you are a DGCSIR, you have some advantage. You get lots of information from lots of sources. And you are often asked to do something very different, you know, the new plan. Every quarter, Delhi demands new ideas. And this was one of the ideas where <laughs> uh, to, can we have a health centers in rural India to capture data? And this data capturing took place through HP collaboration. And I was lucky to have Dr. Anurag Agarwal. And Dr. Anurag Agarwal, with three places we, we started, 
and this paper was published in 2013. And these data were all captured, cloud, and brought to the uh, IGIB, and telemedicine facilities were created. Uh, I think video is not working, so they moved. So you can see it's a real-time information. Actually, this HP created the video where these uh, containers were equipped with facilities in rural India, and they were actually able to transmit the data. Now, what is that? This is the beginning of our data capturing of the rural India. We even don't know what is the average uh, hemoglobin count of uh, Indians. We don't know even average blood sugar levels. So even simple things are not known to us. We all believe with Western standards and next slide and go on doing. Today, this, just press next, uh, uh, go back. Uh, this is today, uh, we are happy to say that about 100 locations, although CSR did three, HP has taken it forward as a part of the CSR, CSR activity. And we have uh, the, <coughs> presently it is going on in, uh, captured in, uh, <coughs> in uh, the data. And based on the data, I'll give you one example how it is uh, taken. Next slide. So you can see the stock of the medicines are given. And now we do analytics, prescription of the medicine, then the analytics, next slide, press it. Ah. Now you can see there is a quite excellent correlation between the prescription and the storage. Where there are two outliers where it is more prescribed but less talk. So now you can see this is what a policy happens where people can say, hey, these medicines are prescribed, but not in stock. This is the power of analytics to reach for the poorest of the poor. Don't think data is only important for business. Data is important for the poorest of the poor to provide them service. Next slide. Uh, Professor Brahmachari, uh, is it possible for you to tilt your uh, camera till behind? We are not able to see your face while you're talking. Okay. That's why I said I can't see myself. So if you can put it on myself, this screen is yeah, perfect. Okay. This is no, perfect. Yeah, perfect. Per you, per perfect. Thank okay. you. Sir. So you know, I haven't left this to the government. So we have uh, started it for West Bengal uh, uh, with the state support uh, uh, startups. Next slide. And this is called Epoch, and actually it is collecting using the rural children trained to collect digital data and provide services to the rural bank. So this is a new startup. It's just beginning this began this year. So this is what the way the future is. Next slide. And basically, you want providing, you know, much before lockout. Last year we planned this uh, to provide telemedicine because you know Indian rural is really neglected with respect to the uh, availability of uh, healthcare. So even simple. Blood pressure measurement is not possible. You know, you and I have bought extensively in our oximeters, uh, 2,000 rupees or uh, to be sure that we have good oxygen. But think about the poor people at, in the village. Who is going to measure unless we have the resources? So this is a new entrepreneurial approach to train people and do that. Next slide. <clears throat> so what is the future? Whole medicine today is reactive. You fall sick, then you go to hospital. COVID has taught us to be proactive. Wash your hand, wear your mask, make an eight feet distance. Now, why distance? This is from the high-end science that we know the droplets, how long it hangs, and these are all done with very sophisticated experiments. So you can see we have suddenly, COVID has pushed us from a reactive to proactive environment. And fourth paradigm in, you know, is called P4H. It's called preventive, proactive, predictive, and personal precision or personalized medicine is the future consortium. We have articles you can read in the journal if you put that. And you can see what we are to moving is that is integration of data at all levels, all biochemical data. Actually, in the stage A, you are normal. Stage B is actually your biochemistry has started changing, but you have no chest pain. You have a cardiac cholesterol is going up. Stage C is where you actually go to doctor. By the time you have a car chest pain, you have a breathing problem, how do you go to doctor before from the analytics? So that this is the power. This is what will be the future of science. 
How do we connect all these informations? How do we use traditional medicine and modern? And today you can see for the COVID time, whole world is using traditional and modern together. Next slide. So, <clears throat> so human of the future will provide more data than we can even think of by the sensors. Next slide. This will be us and many of us are already part of it. Where the lens, you know, there will be smart lens, measure glucose, we will have electronic tattoo, cricket players are putting normal tattoo, tomorrow they'll put all electronic tattoo so that uh, their actual ability, muscle, data, usage, every ball, how it is happening, the socks will be, football players are already using the socks to understand the distance traveled, all sorts of things. You know, you know that football players are taken out the moment they have run enough, nine kilometers. So like that, health of tomorrow, will, it's all digital data. How do you integrate this digital data with biochemical data, with genetic data, and put them together? Next slide. Next, just pre pressing. Uh -huh. So it's, it has a huge minimum, you know, it'll minimize the number of patients versus doctors. We, rural India doesn't have doctors, so we will be able to get data. The patients from the hospital to home care, you can already see, COVID has shown us how much home care uh, facilities, each of the upper lows and 40s have started giving home care packages. But this slide I made much earlier, you know, this is pre-COVID <laughs> slides. Shift from, you know, episodic encounter to continuous surveillance and natural language processing to extract more value from patient-physician interaction. I think this is going to be, now how do you capture a telemedicine conversation and use that as a digital platform for the library of tomorrow? Next slide. <clears throat> It will record from shift from electronics and therefore AI enabled population health, assisting frontline health workers, patient virtual health assistants. Uh, already Siri does many things and there are uh, other softwares have come offering physician the clinical decision support system. So it's not replacing the doctor, it is augmenting the doctor. So that's the way uh, just an, 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 an aerospace engineer will understand that uh, auto landing is not without a pilot. Auto landing of the aircraft is assisting pilot to align and control. So this is how exactly the AI will be. So there's no fear that there'll be replacement. It will be augmented. Next slide. <clears throat> so major AI applications in health, you know, data scientists can look at it, you know, classification, descriptive, predictive, and prescriptive. Prescriptive will come much less, you know, intervention with the base of the causal understanding. So until AI tells me what is the cause, prescriptive will still remain uh, wait, wait and watch. Next. I want to give you again Indian example. The first is the QCR. This is the X-ray of the TB patients, which is through AI. You know, it's a Bombay based startups. Then Docturnal is a Timble, is a shop, is they have developed a voice based, cough based detection of TB patients. Right? Next slide. This is our ICST effort is that AIML based, mobile based cough detection and uh, to predict likelihood of TB. TB cup versus non TB cup. I'm very proud to say the idea we generated last year. And this year, MIT has actually done for the COVID uh, cup, cup base. And this has happened a few weeks, two weeks back. So this is, you know, you generate idea, then you bring people, bring them together, and you need lots of expertise. Next slide. <coughs> this has happened. Uh, is a CSIR effort, IGIB, CSIR CD, uh, and, and caring. Caring is the uh, Mahajan Clinic, and they have come up with this COVID base and AI-based X-ray detection for pneumonia for COVID. Next slide. <clears throat> and you can see it has a nine, it has a 87% uh, accuracy, a negative predictive value of 98%, whether this COVID patient has pneumonia or not. Next slide. 
I'll give you an example of two more startups with which I have been involved post retirement and this science I do. This is uh, I CHR, this is a PhD student of mine through ACSIR, joined as an industry sponsor project. And he himself, uh, you know, it's interesting that he had a desire to do PhD uh, and came to me in 2006. But his family comes from a quite rich family. So I told him, you better go and make money. You are a Sadaji, other will not be happy. And then he came back 2013 when I was DG and said, I drive Mercedes. My wife uh, drives Audi. So I believe now I can uh, be do a PhD with you. I said, yes, go ahead. Only condition was that it, I will guide him after my retirement. Only condition another was that he has, his PhD should convert into startups and not only papers, patents, but actually products. Next slide. So India Child Health Record is the first of its kind and unique. It is hospital EMR based, benefit for the parents and benefit. You know, if you ask me, can you produce, you know, during COVID, lots of people were asking, have you taken BCG? When was the BCG taken? Did I give BCG? Where is the record? Nobody has the record. So, but these children, um, of a half a million of them already have these records. And this is to create the record so that you know in the cloud for up to 12 years, you keep the record. Next slide. <clears throat> and there are children born in India who are premature and this is a serious problem. Next slide. <clears throat> you can see 27.6 million birth of which preterm birth is about 3.5 million and 780,000 die and by five years, 1.3 million children die. Look at the mother's suffering. Next slide. So we decided that this has, next slide, just skip it. About 1 million patients still we can access. So then you know, there's a lot of changes of data and these are all manual entry. Can we make everything digitized? So this is a paperless activity. Next slide. So we created a, <coughs> there are monitors, wormers, blood gas, a child normally has to stay eight weeks if he is born below 1200 grams and human errors are too much. Next slide. It generates five gigabyte data per day. So we created a, a predictive analytics box. Uh, press it again. And this is to automate vital captures, single interface for doctors and nurse and deep learning. Next slide. This is the architecture actual the beds and each bed is connected to the box. This box is in the cloud of the hospital and it can be hospital, doctor screen share and best way you can monitor. So everything has been digitized in PGI Chandigarh. It has been digitized in Apollo's and next slide. And you can see uh, Apollo cradles. So today uh, we have two publications and two patents. And uh, I'm very proud to say that this startup is doing so well and it has office now in Korea, Singapore, Delhi, USA. And uh, next slide. The other startup is for autistic children. You know, this is again Dr. Manu, who met me and listened to one of my IEEE lecture in Bhubaneshwar, came down from Paris and said he wants to leave his cushy job in SAP and uh, Air Liquid, and he wants to get in to start do something. These are brilliant people. You know, in 90s, they went to IT to make money. And once they have money, they have the desire to be a scientist and they come back to solve problems. So Cogniable has received this year's national awards and international awards. Next slide. <coughs> Next press again. So, so basically we have a large number of autistic children and attention deficit disorder is a very large number, but we have very small number of uh, practitioners of about 35 people who are certified in India to actually help autistic children. So huge shortage you need to spend, next slide. <coughs> you need to spend a significant amount of money. Uh, and so we built a vision that computer vision and deep learning, technology, web and mobile application, clinical, Evidence base and founded private in 2016. And I have a, you know, all these companies I mentor and I have minor stakes in these companies. Next slide. Uh, this is a collection of uh, artificial intelligence, medical information, data scientists all put together. 
Next slide. And <clears throat> the idea is clinical problem. Next, press it again. So we want to make it up. Today, it costs approximately anywhere between uh, 20 to 30,000 rupees in uh, Gurgaon and Noida and such places for one autistic child. So it's available only to wealthy people. We want to make it 100 rupees a day and online. And next slide. <clears throat> so, you know, this is how you do assessment. You have a treatment plan and then you have a treatment execution. And this is the parent relationships. You know, it's all computing machine learning models. Next, <laughs> I press. And then you run data analytics. And based on that, you see language skill, learning skill. Each skill can be associated with various activities. Next slide. And then I just show you one tip. One, uh, uh, so here you can see it's an AI in action. So to CCD camera, it's learning, and you can see the efficiency of the child is assessed online about his ability to touch, do things roly poly, uh, do uh, touching the nose, touch the book, he has recognition. You can see simultaneously his ability is instantly measured, and computing, it's called online computing, goes on. So we have done this data, and now we have provided the service based on this learning. Uh, next slide, next slide, just go. And so it's, it is the data source, capture the data, and then analytics, and based on this uh, treatment outcome uh, automation. So now today, you would be surprised this uh, business uh, this year has grown from March 60% uh, month to month because people cannot have physical contact, so they want online assessment. Next slide. Now, where is the hope? And this is where my hope, I believe, India can pole vault with safe landing if you provide the right policy. It is the millions of these fireflies, the startups, who can make a difference. And what we need to do is to connect to this, to our national laboratories and institutions, funding agencies, venture funds, and institutions like informatics. How do we create and capture this data and bring people together to create projects and programs that will give India a leadership in digital health. Today we have digital health stack, but I think it needs to have lots of startups support, and I'm sure in the Institute of Science Supercomputing and Sport BI should jump into this and use the power of the youth to make a difference. Next slide. You know, we often quote foreigners. We often quote Albert Einstein. I thought I'd quote Dhirubhai Ambani. Our, he spoke for Reliance, our dreams have to be bigger, our ambitions higher, our commitment deeper, and our efforts greater. This is my dream for CSIR when I was DG, and now for India. Next slide. So think of unthinkable, it's possible. I'm very glad that I could give this deliver this lecture without a snack, and thank you very much. Professor Bhavachari, I, I don't know, we, we can't you know, have a clap and uh, ovation here. Uh, that is one problem of the uh, virtual platform. Thank you. You can remove the screen. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I will just you know, minim minimize it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, can I stop sharing the screen now? Okay, yes. I'll stop sharing. Yeah, yeah. For wonderful, uh, amazing, you just imagine a director of a poor PI is helping me to put because I don't know, I, you know, my iPad scaring screen, it gets distorted and my laptop has broken. So this is the only solution we had yesterday. Well, no problem. <laughs> so, so thank you so much, actually. So I think you, you took us through the entire gamut of activities. Uh, for those who do not know Professor Brahmachari, he can spend about two, three to four hours on each slide if you sit with him. Okay, <laughs> and then he has taken us through the journey in a record uh, 40 minutes, which, you know, like uh, uh, with all the aspects of work he's been doing, especially after he left CSIR. Uh, I, I would like to repeat that, you know, he has lived through the fourth paradigm and uh, he continues to do so. Uh, we're very happy that, you know, we could hear you. Now, at the next part of the program, I... Hello, 
Yeah. I learned one thing hmm. that you can sit in a chair and advise people. Nobody listens. <laughs> I have seen even at India Institute of Science. When 90s, when I was saying genomics is the future, we should have a whole building built for genomics. Nobody listened. I was a young assistant professor. So I learned one thing in India. Do it yourself. Right. Because right. Indians are good in copying, but Indians are not good in starting and taking the fear. Failure, fear of failure is too high. You know, when I made Fourth Paradigm Institute, people made fun of me. And now you are aware of it. But yeah, yeah, I know, I know. Yes, yes. Very, no very, meaning. Uh, very much so. Similarly, yeah. when genomics at IGIB, it was, people made fun. Said, ah, well, look, forget it. In the CBT, you will convert an institute to IGIB. Look today, fell with the diagnostics, first of its kind in the world. Tata is implementing, you know. The ability, you have to build, have confidence as young people. You know, you on my biodata, people say about uh, uh, my, uh, everybody likes my one year Paris. But why did I go to Paris? Because Shashi Shankaran wanted to give me a job. A post was called biological chemist. Directly a student from department to be absorbed will be unlikely. So he told me, you just go and write a letter to Shadish Sh Dhawan. So I went to a molecular biology laboratory and wrote a letter. And I came back 11 months. Shadish Dhawan was surprised. He said, are you sure? Then he told, we don't recruit people who are a lecturer. We recruit future professors. Mm. Right? This was Shatish Dhawan's vision. So therefore, his vision to bring CNR Rao, bring material science, when? In 70s. And GN Ramachandran to do data science. You know, you need leadership of vision. So therefore, my thanks that it's very important in Indian science, we propagate and tell people, it happens in India. Our young generation only listens abroad. So I wanted to give you examples. These are Indians, these are Sadajis, these are Paharis, these are Bengalis, these are Tamilians, not. And many of them never gone abroad. So my stay in France was 11 months. And my visiting Germany was when I was frustrated that I can't do in India. So I was invited to be to build a genomic center in Max Planck in 1996. So I went there for three months. But I cut short two months because I got the directorship of CSIR to build the genomics in 97. So I did not, I can tell people, I take a lot of pride to say, I didn't have to go abroad to learn. I was Jan Shashi Shekhar and GN Ramachandran, CNR, there were enough people who could tell you that great science can be done in India. And I think it is very, very important that we pass on this message to the young generation. And uh, we are too often, look at these young colleagues of my IGIB, what they have done during COVID is unbelievable. You know, we were doing 10,000 tests and daily. So so they they 1.23 no, no, no. no, no. it is possible. It's amazing what has happened. Uh, uh, you, your mic got muted, Professor Brambachari. Uh, not yet. Maybe the host can unmute it. Uh, ah, yeah, okay. Yeah. So I say that as a nation, Mr. You know, Satanarayan, I'm sad that I didn't know you. It is sad. I felt sad yesterday. Right? How little we take pride in our each other's achievement. I think it's a time for the nation, for the new generation to take pride. And I request Shalini, change your pitch next time. Take away all foreigners and talk about Indians who bought things. Right? Our Western training, I'm glad that I've never trained in abroad. Our Western training is our failure. Although Bhutkabi is Berkeley PhD, but still I'm telling this. I, I tell you, G. N. Ramachandran didn't have to. He, he was genius. Shashi Shekhar is genius. Right? And we don't know them. You know, there is a book coming. Govind Sarup is an example. 
as to you know building such telescopes. So I hope you all read the book. It's coming out. Uh, Space, Matter, and Life: A Journey of Indian Science by Pulkat Hori. That will be a book. I'm you know I have read all the twelve chapters because I helped him. Is a story of Indian science that what mm -hmm. India has done for the young generation. So my request to all of you. Uh, data scientists, please promote and propagate GPS Raga, his servers, and uh, you know there are people who has done it, doing it today. Thank you for this opportunity to share online with them. Yeah, so, so we, 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 we need some, some more of your time. One of the important the thing is to address some of the questions uh, from the uh, panel members, or they call discussants as per the nomenclature. Sure. So I will sure. call upon. Uh, uh, Mr. Seshadri K.R. is a PhD student at IISC to put forward his question or a discussion point. Uh, we have 11 people who will go through this. I request everybody's you know, participation and patience. Uh, Mr. Seshadri, please. Are you online? Yeah. Uh, am I audible? Yes, you are audible. Please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, uh, thanks a lot, uh, Professor Panchari, for your uh, chill, uh, uh, thoughts on the matter. Uh, so, uh, I just wanted to sort of uh, uh, bring your attention to the ongoing uh, pandemic plus COVID, right? So, uh, my, uh, my premise is uh, the data science aspect of detecting or uh, formulating the transmission of the uh, virus and so on uh, sort of did not work as expected and it was as good as our best guesses. Uh, I've been following a lot of articles on this from uh, various journals, and most of it, right from March till May, May about uh, till about May, uh, predicted this to be ending by June with all solid models. So, would you say that uh, uh, all this is driven by our intuitions and uh, it's not the other way around, or do you see yeah. there back loop? I got your question. Yeah, I got your question. Uh, right. I can tell you, I was sad. I was sad that India Institute of Science and JNCR put a model. By May, several hundred thousand in India will die. You know why? Because data scientists did not talk to immunologists, biologists. You know, I I quoted in April that India's situation of death will be decided by Dharabi. Hmm. Dharabi has three thousand eight hundred cases out of eight lakh people. No social distancing, same toilet. How is it happening? So there are certain immunity working. So I did a lot of, you know, me and my student, Vinod Skaria, we had a lot of conflict of discussions. I always say the death will be less in India because of TB, because of VCG vaccination. So my personal feeling is our data scientists, those who predict that, you know, I've seen Boston consultant, you know, from the day zero. And they did not actually interact with the domain experts. If you interact with domain experts, this is a clear example that domain expertise is important uh, in prediction, predictive models. And I think one of the reasons that it didn't succeed, then you have human behavior, yeah. right? You have to factor in that Durga Puja in Bengal. You know, mm -hmm. yesterday I collected data for Bengal. There is no spike. Mm -hmm. How come? I talked to the 40s hospital to get is it a spike. Whereas Delhi, there is a spike because of uh, Navaratri and Diwali coming. So what is the difference? If you go back and so there are interesting uh, correlates one builds in. Is there an economic disparity decision? Is there social behavior? So you know, these are doesn't go into your mathematical modeling. The first Stanford model said there will be quarter million Americans will die only in California. Right? If you go back to the Stanford model, the reason is your model is a randomized model that you be everybody interacts with everybody, which doesn't happen, right? We have a clusters, but you don't interact with everybody at ISC. You interact with a certain group of people. So we have a, our interaction pattern is not random. So mathematical models, your assumptions are very important, and these right. are weaknesses because there is no parameters that you can give. For social interaction, you cannot give a parameter of Navaratri or traffic movement in Delhi, cell, how do you do? How do you build in all this in mathematical model? 
So therefore, observational data and taking it forward is much higher, much more successful than you know Bihar, nothing will happen during election. You can see that. Because now somebody say why? Because I say Jewish Amish community lives with cattle, they have low infection. Maybe having cattle in the house may give low infection. We don't know. Maybe cow dung gives infection, potential, you know, resistance. So your innate immunity, relationship to social behavior, data is not modeled. Right. Yeah, uh, I have had a follow-up question, but I would uh, maybe uh, others can take it over and they might yeah. sort of find it. Okay. You can send me Bye. email. You can send me email. I will respond. To yes. You. Yeah. So I think I, I think you can send me email. I can actually you know like uh, interact with the Professor Brahmachari, and then you know, take that responsibility post uh, these discussion sessions. Sure. Right. Thank you. So uh, let me let me go to the next person, uh, Dr. Anjan. Are you there? Yes, yeah, you, you are there. Okay. Yeah. Much, yes, we would like to see you. Thank you. Yes, please yeah, go ahead. Uh, in our forest, the bandwidth is a little bit. Uh, erratic, yes. <laughs> so. I, uh, nice to see you, Dr. Brahmachari. It was a fascinating lecture. Uh, there are just an incredible canvas for 40 minutes. But let me come to you on an area that I am personally very interested in. I think I mentioned to you that before I became a scientist, I was a journalist. Mm -hmm. And I've taught journalism for a few years. I have a student out there now who is doing research. as a, Now he's a professor at Northumbria University. And he does work on uh, the intersection of public health behavioral science, and social media. 2018, during the Zika outbreak, so I'm following on with the previous question from Dr. Shashadri. Uh, he wrote a paper, a seminal paper, called Managing Social Media Rumors and Misinformation During Outbreaks. And I'm very interested to have your take on, if I look at a, you know, a delta information over delta T, keeping in mind that in today's mm -hmm. world, uh, and in the theme of the theme of this conclave, people equate knowledge with information. People forget that there is a four step from information to insight to intuition to innovation. That's right. Which is under, underlined by e-science. People forget that completely. So people think information is knowledge. I wanted to ask you, the rate of transmission of the disease versus the rate of transmission of misinformation, how does that impact as a second order effect on the rate of transmission of the disease. Yeah, you know, this is very, very interesting. And actually, you know, in the month of February, I, I realized this is going to be a chaos. And I have not been a great virology knowledge I didn't have. So I started reading because I was managing, I was mentoring a startup in Bangalore who are genetic diagnostics. So I read and figured out, uh, I read a lot. And because I had nothing else to do. And uh, March, whole March and all, and interacted with IGID. I realized that actually panic that was happening in social media is actually good for India. Because all old people stayed back home. That's why our death is low. Anybody had a comorbidity, comorbidity became such a big thing. Everybody stayed home. You will look at the death data and look at the infection data. You will see our middle age, you know, 40s to 55 is the most affected individual because the 70s and above never came out. So this is, a, and those who had old parents, they became very cautious, right? So in some sense, overstatement, this media publicity and lots of news, in some sense helped for India, but it is very bad because uh, it also, you know, I'm sure the American election uh, gave a lot of people in Bihar feeling that there's no need to wear mask, right? So therefore, fortunately they are uneducated. They don't listen to CNN. So there is advantage. Otherwise, if you listen to CNN, you will you know, look at the rallies and then you'll say, oh, there's no need to wear mask. You can, so this is where uh, I think knowledge, wisdom comes out of assimilation of the data. And that needs domain expertise. 
you know, <clears throat> when we talk about vaccine, what will happen? So <clears throat> my reaction is, you are able to hear? Yes. Yeah, I can hear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We can hear you. Suddenly, yeah. your image went off, so I got nervous whether my internet will stop. So <laughs> I think it is very important that all people who are data scientists understand the wisdom of science. Okay? And I can tell you one interesting, in, uh, in the month of April, I got requests from a large investment fund that they want, they're all clients, which is a large number of, they want to learn about COVID disease, COVID vaccine, COVID drugs, COVID diagnostics. So it was a very interesting webinar. Uh, <coughs> and unfortunately that got recorded and transcribed. So I have a very beautiful evidences to say that how early in April I told mask is going to be must for the next year. Forget about it. So, you know, it is you have to understand that because vaccine will not come. Today we are talking about mask is the alternate to the vaccine. It is obvious from the science that the droplets protection is the way, best way. So, so therefore it is very important that information is not given based on one side of the shadow like politically, you see one side, you don't see the other side. Uh, to get a 360-degree understanding with domain expertise. Unfortunately, our information scientists are not connected to the domain experts. IGIB is lucky that it built information science and domain expertise together. Thanks, Anjan. Thank you. Uh, I'll just uh, call upon next person, uh, uh, Mr. Mayuk Bakchi. Are you connected? Yeah, yeah. Uh, can you listen? Is it audible? I'm just Hello? To, yeah. Be a little louder, please, Mayur. Yeah. Okay, okay. Is it audible now? Uh, yeah, yeah, you can maybe come a little closer to the system your or something. It's showing half of your face. Yes. Okay, so now, now, now? Yes. Yeah, now better. A little better. Yeah. better. Okay, okay. So thank you for such a refreshing lecture, sir. <laughs> So my, my question is uh, general and, and it relates to the role of uh, libraries. So given, the, given their emerging role as, uh, as open science and research data management hubs uh, within research institutions, so what do you think should be the important uh, highlights of an, of an e-science policy vis-a-vis -vis libraries? Yeah, I completely believe in open science, open sharing, and you can see during COVID, even the prize journals, Nature Science, they all COVID, COVID publications were open. I don't know, five years later, whether it will be available open. And so I will suggest uh, Mr. Uh, you know, uh, Informatics, please download them, create a library, <laughs> so that tomorrow it's not, you know, I can tell you for TV, 45,000 papers have to be read to build the system biology model. We use 1,200 students. One third of the date papers were not available on public domain. Three students wrote emails to all those people and collected those papers. And we created local, on our server, a digital library of TV data in 2010. Okay? That had 54,000 papers. So therefore, yes, you are right. Uh, we need to create, I, I wish India takes the PDB data uh, center, which India of Science is supposed to be part of it. And four PI institutes should work with informatics and create databases that are important for India. And India Stat is a big company which produces a lot of data. So, you know, India has capability. It's a matter of integrating the relationships and connecting the dots. Innovation is nothing but connecting the dots. So I am completely with open, open data, open sharing, uh, open belief. The world with uh, COVID pandemic has, I think, uh, realized that openness is an important component to handle. Uh, you know, I don't know how many of you have seen the American movie Independence Day, <clears throat> when we have an alien attack, all countries were cooperating, right? Even Russia, America, China, Japan, everybody was cooperating. Pandemic is that alien attack, invisible enemy. So we realize we need to cooperate. Global solidarity trials are required. 
And this is a great transition moment. I can tell you, pharma companies are nervous. You know, if this tsunami takes place and everything goes over to open source, comes, you know, but I always tell the pharma companies that look at, look at uh, Linux. 95% of the world's supercomputers run on Linux. Open source, you can make money. Android, open source making money. So it's not that open source pharma will not make money. It's that open source pharma should learn from the CEOs of the Craig and IBM how to use open source as a business model, GitHub. So I think we also have to understand, you have to sustain your libraries. Bioinformatics, you know, your informatics company of Satyanarayana cannot run without money. So how do you use this information to create knowledge and create value-added knowledge and wisdom, which is highly valuable? So if you just provide the raw information, I think its market is low. Uh, with the permission of the chair, if I may say, Professor Brahmachari, uh, we are capturing all the published literature in the scientific area in Ankove. Uh, as of today, we have about uh, 1.1 uh, lakh uh, papers, including the preprints, uh, mm -hmm. about yeah, 1 lakh 16,000 as of today, out of which 70,000 are available in open access. Excellent. And this is what the data will be the first thing to build COVID pandemic model. And we have to now do text mining. Little, yes. You know, it's a, this lot of high data science right. now coming, right? Sophisticated text mining software, then image analysis software, all this will put together, then epidemiological data. And then that's the, that's the future. That's the way e-science goes. Thank you. So. Uh, I can see Dr. Mandar uh, Mutalik Desai. Can you please uh, put forward your uh, question or discussion point, please? Sure. Uh, thank you, Professor Mukavi. And uh, if you will allow, I have two questions. Will you introduce yourself? Will you introduce yourself, Mandar? Sure, sir. Uh, my name is Mandar uh, and I work for IBM. Uh, oh. I, I work as a data scientist. And uh, Watson, Watson. What is Watson? Right? <laughs> yeah, so. And uh, yeah, I've been uh, I've been uh, a, a long time collaborator of uh, Professor Shalniars. So uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity. Uh, I really have two questions, uh, but I'll leave it to Professor Mutkavi to decide if uh, there is time for the second one. Please uh, go ahead. Go ahead with two questions. No problem. Thank you. Thank you. So the, the first one is that it, you made a very interesting point about how COVID has made the society more proactive instead of being reactive when it comes to health concerns, right? And that got me thinking that when you look at certain other conditions that plague the Indian population, and I'm sure the population world over, um, something like diabetes kills over 10 lakh people every year, said to kill over 10 lakh people every year, has an incidence rate of about 10% in the urban population and about, about 2 to 3% in the rural population, right? Some you don't know. You don't know rural population. Yeah, exactly. Nobody measures. Right, exactly. So that's very much possible. It's, it's quite possible nobody measured it. But uh, assuming that the urban numbers are, you know, fairly correct, what puzzles me is from a sociological perspective, from a behavioral perspective, what is it about conditions like diabetes that doesn't make us proactive? There we still remain reactive. But when it comes to something like an infection, we are somehow proactive. I just wanted to understand your take on this. Fear of death. <laughs> but uh, doesn't diabetes kill uh, a lot more people? It does, but it's a silent killer. Ah, okay. So it doesn't right? make much when noise. You see, when you see a COVID patient being handled with a PPE, you become <laughs> right. right. So we are, we, we are reactive to the, to the noise that is created around it. The therefore, it is important that's why, you know, our P4 medicine in consortium, which in Europe, we have convinced uh, 50 million euro from the billion euro from the consortium. In India, it hasn't taken off. You know, we are, wrote this article long back, but three years back, but nobody has taken off seriously. So, but that's a, that's a very important component. So there is a now new opportunity to make people understand that preventive care is better. You just see people have been walking exercising at home uh, during COVID because to build immunity. 
Okay, many right. people didn't realize that strong immunity can also have a cytokine in search, and that can actually cause your, you know, make this disease more severe. So it's a is a is a very interesting balance between your strong immunity, immunity response, cytokine in search. So, you know, in so but everybody has started doing a lot of exercise. You know, I have walked uh, every day within my compound only up and down than I have done earlier. In the in, in just the sense of fear that we may have to remain active. Absolutely, and the same is true of me. If I confess. Uh, okay, sec second question, yeah. Second question quickly. Uh, it's, it's very fascinating to learn about all these different initiatives in genomics and I was particularly uh, uh, enamored by this app that you spoke about, Dr. Nil, which tries to predict a tuberculosis case and that is so exciting. There's just one thing that bothers me about how do we, how do we handle the last mile delivery, right? So with all where, are you, where are you located? I'm in Bangalore. Okay, so I'll be in Bangalore soon, and I'll connect you. Okay, sure. this is this is why we wanted to convert into mobile phone. You see, nocturnal is still like a mic; you have to take the mic all over. Right. But if I can do it on mobile phone. That's it. Yeah. But I, that, that also... I capture and then run AI, and I have one million patients versus one million normal calf. Why right. not? Is theoretically right. possible? We need people like you to join hands. I'd love to contribute because it begs the question about access to devices, access to networks. And that is something I'd be really interested in exploring more. So you see, uh, it's a, you only need a 2G line, voice, nothing right. else. Right. You need oh, yes. It can be telephony based rather than... Yeah, so our portal, GPMS Trans Portal, with which Bhutkaviji uh, uh, is involved, it actually has this built in now. Right. Right. Lovely. I, I would love to... Uh, but uh, we haven't got enough data to analyze and we didn't have an AI expert to analyze. Yes. Only we have a Delhi-based guy who is doing something. So, you know, these are, I'm trying to connect people. So the problem is we have only, I know of, uh, less than half a dozen MD, MBBS MD who are, who understands AI. Hmm. Yeah. Right? Anurag Agarwal, Kapritesh, like that few in fingers, you know. So, or you have to bring two domains together and make a one satta. You know, right. there should right. be, right. you know and right. this is a huge domain overlap problem. Absolutely. And I experienced this when I was using my uh, Agbit Singh, who is an AI expert, uh, with uh, Ayurveda data. Oh, it was so difficult because those guys are so different data available. Their data with modern medicine to match their interpretations. You know, they would have 330 disease. We brought them into 10 systems. You know, I can share the paper. It's a, it's a challenge to work. So I define myself as a multi-pin adopter, international multi-pin adopter, you know, connecting to sockets and connecting to the points, connecting people. So my job is just connecting people. That's all. Okay. okay. Yeah. Next. Thank, so, you. Th thank you. Thank you very much. And the uh, next one, uh, we have uh, Jayati Deshmukh, uh, PhD student at uh, Triple IT Bangalore. Can you please oh. uh, put forward your question? Sure. Thank you. Thank you, sir. She is the smartest. She yes. made her screen biggest. <laughs> you can see the people smarter they are. So I, could, I do not want to work with Mutkavi. I want to work with you. <laughs> you understand? You can get the smartest. Uh, th thank okay. you. Yeah, Th thanks so for the uh, very great and interesting talk, sir. It was uh, very inspiring. Uh, my question was in continuation to uh, what uh, uh, Mandal asked just now. So, especially uh, uh, you gave very interesting examples in the uh, healthcare uh, domain and so on, especially uh, startups which are working in that. What is your take on uh, protecting uh, the privacy of the people? So, uh, how uh, privacy is protected in that uh, these kinds of use cases and uh, how we can build a data protection law at a national level to so that uh, it it applies to all uh, these kinds of uh, uh, startups which are working in these areas yeah yeah it's very interesting uh, you know it is different from western thought to indian thought you know if you have somebody has fallen sick right, in your family, 
uh, is a COVID. Immediately they will say, have you tested RT-PCR? They say, yes. What was the CT value? Yes. How was the oxygen saturation? Everything we want to share with others. Okay. Mm -hmm. In India, we are culturally very different, right? Okay. We believe in horoscope. When your marriage will be fixed, your parents will look at the horoscope. So we are not really very worried about data protection with respect to healthcare. Number one. Western world, it is a very serious matter. Okay. But look at your generation in Facebook and Instagram, the pictures you put, you don't share with your parents. Mm. Correct? So you are actually a generation who is ready to share. You have seen in our, my presentation that I covered the face of the child. Right. And that way we do, and then we create this anonymized data. So basically, human genome has taught us how to do this, how to collect data and then consent. But you will be surprised. We took 191 years plus old people for their genome sequencing out of this thousand hundred is there. And we asked them, do you mind? We take your photographs and we share your information. They had no problem. They said, yes. So we took all their habits, who smokes, who drinks, who eats non veg So that allowed us to find a lot of interesting things, you know. So I have seen in India, it's important for the researchers to protect the privacy of individuals, but uh, people are not so bothered. And especially young generation with the social media, the way they put their things and, and they're very open. So that's my reaction. Yes, we should have data law, data protection. You know, clinical trial data is a very serious issue. Uh, I believe that we should do clinical trial uh, data open mm -hmm. uh, because the reason is simple. Patients consent you take that you want my data to be open or not open. If I allow open, you anonymize me, mm -hmm. but share the COVID trial data of one center to another right. center, to another center with all the data. Then we will become, bring vaccines faster. Unfortunately, we do not share data in some sense. There are risks also. Okay, there are, there are issues which political and pharmaceutical industry has some problem. Now, if you sh share data, then the government of India has to permit a patented products whose mm -hmm. clinical trial has taken place can be launched in India without a trial in India, but you don't know with our genetic variation, uh, what would be the risk. So I will say we need a new generation of clinical trials which is open data sharing clinical trials. I wish COVID happens where the patients themselves will volunteer to share their data. And then we can work on, uh, you know, today, if you look at Nixi data, TV data, it's protected. But, you know, uh, problem is then we don't get the line data. We get a statistical data. Unless you have a line data, have all the phenotype, yes, you change the address, Problem is, you and I today has given our mobile number to everybody. Mm. Aadhaar card, through bank, through even shopping malls. So you and so basically we are. It is trackable in some sense. It is trackable. Of course, abstract situation you can deal. If I have your DNA sequence from this, I can trace you back. But anyway, the guy who is cutting your hair has your DNA. If he wants, he can do it. So therefore, I will say we are overdoing on data privacy also is not a great idea. Individual right versus collective right mm. is, a, is a balance between the two. And collective commons protects the data that you have produced. If you use those data, then you must be able to contribute back to the data. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Thank you very much. Uh, let me go to the next person, uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Narari Shastri. Uh, oh. Can you please put your question forward? He is using my link, therefore he is known by my name, but he is Dr. Narari Shastri, Director of Nish Your Heart. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Hello, sir. How are you? Fine, Narari. It's really charging to listen to you. And uh, what you have taught us is to think differently. Are we not suffering from knowledge toxicity this data science is producing? 
I feel completely perturbed in flabbergasted when a poor beggar is subjected to an RT-PCR test by paying 5,000 rupees and then force them to wear a mask and a traffic constable chases them if they don't have a mask. So now let us look at the epidemiology of these infectious diseases. And we will have to understand that there are cultural differences, there are financial differences, and there can be several problems. I particularly like your two comments that a typical person in Delhi and somebody in rural Bengal are some other place who are uh, really exposed to different kinds of uh, these uh, bacterial infections. We never cared to have a mask when we go to a fever hospital with infectious diseases, despite fully knowing that the flu does not have a vaccine. Tuberculosis, sir, you are an expert and you forced most of us to work on it, is much more contagious. Did than I force or you voluntarily came? You said force. Uh, a little bit. We will discuss offline <laughs> on that. Forced you, right? What is you? Yeah, yeah, folks. So then uh, we are not so much worried when a tuberculosis patient was around, but all of us know, it's a common knowledge, that its infectivity may be comparable with COVID, but its fatality is much higher. Yeah. And there are things like uh, HIV, we are struggling to get a vaccine. You know why it's the difference on tuberculosis versus COVID? COVID affected Amitabha Bachchan, COVID oh. affected Prime Minister, yeah, COVID affected Amit Shah, COVID affected rich people. Mm. Whereas tuberculosis affects poor people who do not have enough nutrition. So but, therefore, uh, our society reacts. Today, 500 deaths in India, 1,000 has died today in TV. No TV news. Never it has a TV news in 10 years. The reason is we are actually worried about ourselves. We are very selfish. And it has affected the upper middle class. If you carefully realize that although we might say, oh, maid starving from the slum will bring the infection, they are not affected. The Dharabi has proved that they are not affected, but they might be transmitting. And they have transmitted to uh, Bollywood and uh, hills, you know, Malabar Hill. So that's the fear. Oh. So therefore, you can see Bihar is a great example. First, they have done more testing. Bihar is a great example. Why Bihar did? Look at Assam. You're, you know, with flood, this, that, it would have been devastation, but it has not happened. Just in India. Sir, when there was not a single case in Jorhat, all of us are shivering and then we were in masks yeah. and then nobody went out even to get out <laughs> of their gate. Right. But when there are everybody is infected, there are people who are completely traffic jam and then in one auto, 15 people sit there and uh, you know, what things is are like that. Information flow. As information flew and you started seeing that mm. some amount of treatment possibilities, some amount of care, you know, recovery rate, all this. In the beginning, nobody knew what it was. I think in the beginning, we are seeing all the Italian deaths, you know, and uh, scenarios yes. were scaring us, I think. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. As That's the people what... have access to this TV, they read the, they went through the Contagion movie one more mm -hmm. time, and they were even more scared. Yeah, and I the also... reason, is, reason is happy hypoxia was a fear. Mm -hmm. That means mm -hmm. your oxygen level will fall, but you will not know. That's how right. the... In the people were falling off in the road and dying. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's right. right? Yeah. Those yeah. pictures scared people. Why it is happening? Right? Now the science was known. You understood the droplets. We understood the oxygen. We understand the cytokine in search. We know what action. So, you know, in a, in a hundred days, so much of knowledge got generated. Diagnostic got generated. So, therefore, it is our fear decreased. Now, middle young people think that it's okay. 1% chance, of, you know, in India, me and Anurag calculated uh, the risk is 0.1%. 0.1% is like a motorcycle accident. 
So yeah. you stop driving motorcycles. So the, but I I am happy that people were taken protection until all this knowledge was available and medical system got prepared. Otherwise, we would have had a riot on mask collection. Mm. You know, prices of masks would have been hundreds of rupees. And I think it was very nice of the government to say that you can cover it with any cloth, anything. You know, that was I think Prime Minister did a very good job that you don't really wear too much. And if you look at if you look at Bihar, UP, Rajasthan, people actually use for normal, yeah, no, no. even to avoid heat, cold, people cover themselves. So, you know, it's a cultural, just Japanese or Koreans wear mask as a habit. Mm. Whereas we'll go to a TV hospital without wearing a mask. Right? Mm. You know, I have gone to Petal Chest Hospital in Delhi, but never wore a mask because you know your immunity, with, you have a nutrition. So TB is sitting with it. No, TB has become endemic. So there is a belief that COVID will become an endemic. Mm. Once it is endemic, then its expression will depend on your immune system. So as long as your nutrition is high, you are unlikely to get TB. That is what you believe. But still, rich people get TB. In my family, people have got TB. But they can recover because medicine is there. But I can tell you, if you get a drug-resistant TB, two, two years, the number of tablets that you will eat and the injections you will take, it's horrible. Now I have my question. If I can, uh, Mutkavi, can I answer? Okay. 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 The question is, do we have an advantage because we have an educated, we are educated compared to somebody who is not educated? Do we have an advantage or we don't have an advantage? Yeah. My grandmother, who is not educated. Yeah, I understand. But I understand what you are saying. What do you mean by education? Mm -hmm. You would think your degree is your education? No. First, I want to correct your number. 2,400 was the uh, RTPCR cost. In Delhi city, in Delhi state, nobody had to pay. Government paid. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. Nobody had to pay. Mm -hmm. in in, I don't know about Karnataka, but we are pay. Think, Karnataka to pay. Mm. Yeah, you don't have to pay. Okay, nobody pays. So it's a good social system. I think it's it's a very important system. The second thing is, uh, sometimes you say ignorance is bliss, right? You know, if if somebody does a lot of Google, even a little stomach upset, you will think I have got diarrhea. I have got a symptom of COVID, and you may. You know, there you have seen some people have done suicide before the report mm. of COVID positive came. It, it is it, it's ignorance, no? Or over knowledge. So in Bengali, there is a proverb called Alpo Vidda Bhayankuri. When having a little knowledge is dangerous. So I will suggest that it's best to talk to the expert and take their view. And you know, I had privilege to talk to Balram Bhargava, I'm talking to, I'm talking to vaccine guys. And, uh, you know, I often talk to Dr. Anurag Agarwal almost daily basis. So, you know, if you are experts, you are discussing, then you know which decision information is right and which information will be wrong. And that's the way to go. And number two, I don't think anybody forced poor people to pay. And uh, one of the best thing of India has happened, according to me, that in spite of this huge migrationary author and all, uh, nobody died in hunger. There was food available. And I have called districts in Bihar, in UP, because through my maid servants and connections, to know exactly what is happening. Actually, there was no food actually got available. Grains were, we had a surplus food. I think the biggest, biggest crime, I think, in India is the people who have been owners of construction companies, not able to pay three months right. their wages, I think it is the biggest crime. By let these people without wage to travel, I think this is the biggest crime of humanity. So this is not the poor people responsible. I think it is the well-to-do people responsible to spread the infection from big cities of Maharashtra and other states to all the way to the rural parts of India, whether it is Assam or Telangana 
or you are going to Chhattisgarh. I think it is, you know, these political decisions and mathematical modeling cannot take. It's, it is the individual ownership. I think that's the sad part. Okay, thank you. Shall we go to the next one? Uh, hello, yeah. Yes. Uh, Ms. Nandini SS uh, from BIT Satyamangal, are you connected? Uh, yes. Uh, yes, please. Can you, yeah. Yes, you are audible. Please go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the wonderful uh, talk. Uh, so uh, my point of question is like uh, we are having some current proposed predictive methodologies on ML model which works on symptoms of a particular disease. So based on the symptoms of the uh, uh, patients who are already uh, affected with that disease and based on the data from them and we are building the uh, multiple layers on ml models and we are proposing the predictive uh, model for a particular disease but i'm just eager to know your view on when we are having multiple layers with uh, la with a layer of data from genomic uh, distribution with a layer of data from uh, wearable de devices with a layer of data from the past epidemic effects and uh, uh, all those things. Uh, so, uh, how it is like proposing a, a predictive model on AI in future on on epidemic uh, when an epidemic breaks in? Like um, when an epidemic breaks in, how it is possible based on a predictive model in MI categorizing the people based on the geographic location? Either they are less prone or more prone to that particular epidemic disease. Instead of waiting for the uh, waiting for. Uh, the decision to be taken after the first wave <clears throat> of the epidemic disease. Yeah, I think if you ask me, the models that we have discussed are likely to work better, preventive predictive models for uh, lifestyle disease because the models were built for, as you say, diabetes, cardiovascular, and things like that. Uh, with respect to epidemic of infections, if we were talking about epidemic of diabetes, it is possible. But if it is epidemic of infection and which people will die in two weeks time or three weeks time, then it's a little different. Okay. So I will suggest, I will very much appreciate the people who are building model. And I, I tried a little bit with Harabi. So how about taking the Dharabi data of the people who are having TB and take the Dharabi data of people who has uh, COVID, their symptoms, and then build a model to say in a conglomeration of 800,000 people, how is the disease spread? Okay. So you need to create a localized model and that model will not be applicable to an apartment complex. Okay. So you have to build your model localized models and use those localized models to create patterns. For example, in the university in Paris, they use switch data for it to see which sector of Paris has a high in the incidence of uh, COVID because switch your uh, the virus goes and you can do RT-PCR and pick up the... So based on that, you know that this area, people have a lot less symptomatic people, but their switch is showing uh, so like that, I think uh, data from, you know, I'm, I'm sure somebody has collected over sewage data from Maharashtra. And those data will actually help us to say uh, from the symptomatic incidents to number of death and actually the viral load. Right? This will give us an idea how social behaviors, uh, economic prosperity, how they behave. Uh, one of the hypotheses I have, and based on some international data with respect to uh, Jewish Amish population infection rate, those who live with cattle and those who don't, my feeling is if we can do a cattle population overlay where the household has cattle and come up with data to say, is there a COVID higher or lower? My personal feeling is there'll be lower COVID. Because if you look at Haryana, the economic prosperity of Gurgaon is very high, Faridabad is very high. Whereas if you look at the data from districts where uh, more rural and more, more cattle associated people live together, it, and I believe this could be one of the reasons, because I don't know how it gives protection, but yes, as you say, there are certain protections that 
some are genetic some are epigenetic some are uh, driven by the environment the immune response in the water quality and many other infections that are goes on provides a certain amount of immunity so i will say as a modeler you can't do it only in computer you have to understand the social structure that's why you see dharavi model people couldn't predict you know i was very sure dharavi will decide india's fate and uh, in april i so it's very important that uh, we understand uh, assimilate the information and move forward so modelers have a job young people don't get biased by your equations and also see uh, actual quality of data curation of data not only capturing the data when you capture you have to capture three dimensional information then good curation to make sure the data is authenticate and then you run the analytics and regarding machine learning i think any data large machine learning india is one of the largest biological data machine learning person is dr gps ragap in triple it delhi and he is one of the prolific publication publisher on ml application to various uh, epidemiological data so you can contact him it's okay yeah thank you next mutka bhi when take it forward you i think you have to hello yeah. kavi yes So, Dr. Samir sir, it was great interacting with you. It was very extempore, and uh, it was uh, I, I never knew that you are you have done a lot of research in medical healthcare and uh, medical informatics. Uh, and uh, after going through a lot of projects and research, I was uh, impressed with you. I think I may uh, try to get in touch with you in offline in future, and I come to meet you. And sure. uh, and uh, I Not also I interact come... only with younger people. <laughs> yes, sir. Private sector startups. Yes, sir. And... I I don't sit in any committees and I don't yes. attend any committee meetings. Of the <laughs> okay. okay, yeah, and I have one important question I want to ask. I recently I was doing a research uh, AI application in medical research, so I I was I sent to a journal and uh, then I realized that it is not uh, it is totally different from the conventional research what we do in <coughs> management and what we do in computer science, and it was slightly tricky. and uh, i found uh, one issue is that uh, there is a conventional clinical research practice that mm -hmm. is the conventional that medical community does it and uh, suddenly we bringing out uh, cross sectional uh, data it's a huge big data we bringing into it and build, we are building a model and we are predicting something okay. so the clinical research practice is also trying to build something they are predict, uh, predicting the disease or treating how to treat the disease or diagnosing the disease so we are using the conven uh, unconventional big data model to predict or diagnose certain disease okay so if we bring in this uh, in a one single platform so there is a kind of contradiction between the the perception of the both the communities like from our computer science community and the medical community they are having a kind of contradiction with each other this methodology whether it works or not it happens in finance also when i was doing a research in finance financial analytics also it happened so what do you your take on it and also there is one more issue in this case is that ethics committee approval also there so like our crowds uh, crowd uh, crowd research or crowd data we collected across from the various uh, uh, from geographies we integrating it we are analyzing it here so here Uh, the ethics committee approval also required to conduct a certain research so what do you uh, take on this clinical trial research and unconven uh, con unconventional big data analytics research based medical yeah. predictions sir yeah i will start with finance as you mentioned uh, you know if you could have given me an ai model when to invest i think dudunwala would have been out of business 
Yes. Right? So there is a wisdom. The wisdom of the market he had. Yes. So I can give you a simple example. You know, during COVID, suddenly my blood pressure was a little higher. So I have a, India is one of the best cardiologists, uh, I called him. He said, don't worry, it's okay. Don't worry, it's okay. I was getting worried. I was taking medicine. He said, no, don't worry, it's okay. And it all came down normal after a few days. He must have anticipated that I have some anxiety and worries about this or something, you know. So, Dr. B.C. Ray, the first chief minister of Bengal, was a phenomenal doctor. He could smell and tell you have a typhoid. You could hear your cough. You know, the idea of cough came from that story. You know, I'm telling you why. B.C. Ray could hear cough on the corridor and say, who is this person? He says, so and so is coughing. And this, then send him to hospital right away, Nilatun Shankar. He has TV. Right? He will need surgery. Those days you had to do lung surgery, you know, if you have a TV, it was patches are there. You better send him right away. This is wisdom. Millions of cough of patients he has heard and he has assimilated yes. in the brain. So he has run AI on his head. Yes. Right? So Jujunwala is an AI, right, yeah. of the uh, uh, market. So, you know, this is wisdom. What you see, the others don't see. And this is you know, this is where the domain expertise come. Yes. So therefore, please do not underestimate domain expertise based on your few equations. Equations are fine, but domain expertise is the key. Wisdom and knowledge is the key in this information era. You know, I gave a talk, separate talk for CSIR sometime back, SPT, telling how powerful is wisdom and knowledge in this information era. We are flooded with information, but you know, wisdom and knowledge is my most important. I am Professor Chandrasekhar. Can I speak? Yes, sir. It is your turn now. In the same uh, place, uh, Professor uh, Subramanian. Uh, can we call up? Can we call upon Professor Subramanian to? Ah, uh, yes, yes. I am here. Hello. Yeah, yes, Professor Subramanian. Ah, uh, I am Professor Chandrasekhar from IFIM. I studied. My B.Tech and M.Tech from IIT Kanpur, wherever Muthkavi comes. And then I joined TIFR, I worked with that M.G. Kaman and he was the director at that time. After working for a while, I had to shift to ISRO, where you mentioned Satish Dhawan, he was, the, he was my boss at ISRO, he was in the headquarters. For about four years, then Professor Yuarao came. Uh, and then I went to Jardia, did my PhD. Came Your back. video is close, I can't see you. Huh? Professor, your video is... Yeah, he's uh, there now. now. Is there now? Yeah. Okay. So I worked in ISRO for about five, six years. I went to Georgia, did my PhD, and came back and joined the Indian Institute of Management as a professor. Thorough there for about 10 years. What you are talking this AI and machine learning and all, we did at ISRO about 25 years back in space application sure. and NRSA. So I did it. So my question is what I think this AI is a misused word. What we are doing also when we are machine learning, it is not AI. AI, no. yes, AI is when it when the computer is capable of taking a decision like a human person. I Are don't you? think that day has come. My question is: see, there are certain unique attributes uh, which human has, like creativity, innovation, uh, gut feeling, all this. So that's why we have put the word artificial. We never call it intelligence. We call it artificial. That is how the word artificial has been put there. So do you think uh, you, you are a genomic expert? We try to replicate the uh, human brain function by that neural network. And what these, what these uh, machine learning experts call that convolution neural network, recurrent neural network, they are nowhere compared to how the brain functions. And, uh, what CNN it is nowhere. So do you think in near future, how one day it is able to take over the human person taking a decision? Mr. Subramania, I'm very glad that you are from this room. And I said paradigm three is space. And the aerospace has shown us it is possible to model with high precision based on data because it's based on physics. Ah. Physics is a solid science. Yes. Whereas biology is indefinite science. We don't know as much as the way we know the laws of physics. 
That's why we could predict that this many seconds later, this rocket will happen, this will happen. So you all actually, aerospace, astronomy, has actually demonstrated the power of simulations and all these knowledge-based simulations, which you talk, that's where from which other sciences have started learning. So I will completely agree with you. Question is, when we finish the brain map, ah. will we learn something more that we understand already about neural networks? Mm. Presently, neural network is nothing but nothing. multiple layers of information you are trying to connect, creating a black box. Machine learning is a black box because it is unable to explain why it is so. Correct. So the AI will be successful only when it looks at 1 million X-ray scans of chest and eventually tells you why so. The doctor tells you why so. Not that all doctors are right. But the best doctor tells you why so. So biochemical understanding ourselves is the biggest challenge at this point. I will say, you know, human-machine interface will be the next generation after your machine learn, as you said, artificial. Okay? Followed by human-machine interface. And then Human will take decision, cognitive decision, based on other data that is being getting from the other sources. So I will say AI more instead of artificial intelligence. I'll say assisted intelligence. Ah, so to me, AI is an assisted intelligence. It augments your own capability further. It gives you an insight of something that you are not able to see yourself. I have one more question. Second question. A uh, very small question. We have huge amount of information, past research papers and other things. Now, what is happening? Most of the PhD students, they spend a lot of time in that, what we call the literature research. Virtually one year is taken away in this virtual, in this so-called, uh, what we call this uh, research. And I think uh, that's why in our India, uh, the PhD takes about five years to five and a half years. Uh, yeah. Whereas when I did in US, I did it in three years. What I was trying to tell is, can these AI or so-called machine learning systems, can it generate a PhD problem? By going through all that massive research that has happened so far, I will ask you a question. Please give me a PhD problem in this domain. Can you do it? Absolutely. You are, you are absolutely <laughs> dot in the point. You should be able to come up with the gap analysis and say this is a knowledge gap on ah. which we need to create a knowledge. It's absolutely possible. There is no discussion about it. This is the future. Library science future is ah. to assimilate text mining information. Yes. You know, this is what exactly we did for the open source drug discovery by 54,000 papers reading, assimilating, creating a platform. Then we came up and said 890 genes of tuberculosis out of 4,000 genes are responsible to run the make the bacteria grow, of which it has 1,152 reactions. And therefore, if I can block this reaction, it opens other reactions. Normal condition, it uses only 400 odd genes. When it is attacked by a drug, it starts using some other genes. All this was allowed for us to figure out that how a proton transfer is taking place. And we could say, hey, if we block NADH1 site, then it's trapped with the medicine of uh, present medicine. So there'll be no drug resistance. Who can block that? Then we found metformin. Diabetes drug is actually can block. And today metformin is in a clinical trial for TB mm. subadjunctive. So this all came with the, as you exactly say, a research problem that was a PhD. The student is down in Stanford. So that's a PhD problem, looking at assimilated information to making sense out of it and eventually identifying a repurposed drugs, which was used for diabetes, for tuberculosis that June, which is now under clinical trial. So, you know, drug resistant TB is a very dangerous thing. You don't want, therefore, how can you block bacteria's ability to become drug resistant? So this is where, you know, it's called persistence. So therefore, you are absolutely right. 
Now, what does a what does a brilliant researcher do? You know, my everybody asks me, what is your profession? I said, my profession is only thinking. I'm good in it. So if I look at it, I can figure out a research problem. So what is that? Assimilated information allows and say, hey, there is a gap here. Why not work on this? So it's it's in some sense it is augmented intelligence, right? With other informations coming in. So more connected you are. So therefore, my feeling is AI will be an assisted intelligence in figuring out what needs to be done and what are the gaps and how do you put such problems on gap. Completely agree. All time library going on Thursday to Institute of Science evening with your cards, collecting all the current content. You know, this is a past. You know, the way I learned COVID and immunology in 30 days, over 120 days, I would have taken it, you know, several years. It's all mm -hmm. because you could read, 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 connect. And so many of my friends from abroad every day, even today, I get six emails from two guys, old guys. They keep sending all COVID data. Wall tracker, these, that. So, you know, you are connected. So you get information. And many old people, these are all 80 plus people, you know, who are sitting yes. in New York, sitting in New York, uh, loves to send information. One, uh, one thing I will tell in the end. Uh, I met you when we celebrated uh, our uh, Rao's centenary celebration at Hyderabad. Oh, yeah. For the speaker and I, was, I, I spoke after you. So that's why I'm oh, telling you. Yes, sir, your face looks similar. You know what? <laughs> yeah. and, and, and my last thing is, I think there are so many librarians attending this webinar with all the apologies. I somehow tell that library is somewhat not... They are somewhat slow in adopting the technology. You compare to a bank, you compare to a financial institution, you compare to retail. Somehow, I think the, per, the, 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 the use of technology in library, I think, is still on the lower end compared to the other sectors. What is the reason? So, uh, answer. I don't have to answer. I don't want to be unpopular among librarians. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, professor, professor Chandrasekhar, we will take it as another discussion. Okay, okay. Uh, okay yeah. Uh, I am back. I'm sorry you got uh, disconnected. And, uh, uh, you can take yeah. it over, Dr. Mutkavi. Yeah, you yeah, yeah. In the, you are sitting in the most <laughs> of India. I know. <laughs> and the, see, India is one of the highest. I, yes, I, I know, I know. <laughs> I should never lose the connectivity. I know. <laughs> I would like to say that they have launched a library technology conclave. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Please. Yeah. So now I think uh, uh, Mr. Keshavani has finished his question, right? Correct? Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Now I think no. number, uh, uh, not yet? No, no. 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 Keshavani is okay. not yet. Next question is from Manish Keshavani. Uh, okay, Manish uh, Keshwani, uh, please. Next one. And after that, I'll call uh, Dr. Majumdar of RRI. Yeah. Hmm? yeah. Hello. Am I audible? Yes, you yeah, are. Yeah. Please go ahead. Yeah. 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 Hello. Uh, yeah. So I'm Manish Keshwani. I have been part of IBM research for around five years and recently have started my PhD at ISC Bangalore. And first oh. of all, I'd like to thank Professor But you like Rachari. Golden Gate. But you like Golden Gate. Yeah, I think, uh, okay, I can answer it separately. <laughs> so, uh, first of all, I want to thank Professor Bhamshari for a very informative and detailed session. It was really wonderful. So, my question is, like, right now, as we all know, that data is becoming a new medicine. So, like, and data is collected from diverse set of sources. And often these uh, sources have certain errors, which are added in the data. And this data curation, it, till the point it is built into AI, goes through a lot of cleaning and transformation, which sometimes enhances certain different errors. And these errors get translated silently into the AI model. So I wanted to know your view, like is this a high time to have some standardization on some concept like data readiness information, which can be materialized and reproduced? Like I, yeah, it might yeah, help to the, add trust into the data. Yeah, yeah. You know, I when I was looking at the uh, one of the states' uh, data, uh, 
it was very difficult. So many fields are not filled up. Number four, there are 54 softwares, okay, was used. And you have to integrate, pick up the same name. Then, you know, South Indian names, sometimes you write the first name, then you put the second name. Sometimes the data has been entered with part name. You don't know who is who. Then you match with the mobile number is the same or not. Then some mobile operators change his number. So, you know, it is a humongous job of the curation data. That's why I keep telling people, data curation, data curation, data curation. It just cannot be done by few individuals. You have to use like a, a factory. So I, I suggest uh, informatics like organization engage thousands of young students to curate data. You know, data curation is very, very important. And uh, my open source drug discovery, when we involve so many thousand students, <coughs> actually, uh, we made them. There was a big discussion. How are you sure the quality of data will be correct? They are not experts. But I discovered one thing is very simple. If you can give micro attribution and some credit, Indian students are amazingly hungry and competitive. So if you find the right data, you get three points. If you find somebody's data wrong, then you get one point yourself and he loses one point. Oh my God. They will do riot to find fault of others to collect points. And this exactly happened. We could curate 4,000 genes just like that with these 400 students fighting morning evening, saying, no, no, you are wrong. I read the paper, you made wrong, I made wrong, correct. Then when this dispute, and all were on Google Docs and Google Drive and uh, Twitters, and we had our own internal system, then expert comes in and says, okay, I will see both the points and then take it call. It's like an umpire's call, right? In a T20 cricket is umpire's call. So that, that is how you improve the quality of the curation. Curation, curation, curation. As much as data you can capture digitally, the better. So digital capture, then data manipulation becomes less because you have a trail of uh, modifications will be recorded and then curation, curation, curation. Once your data is golden data and you know that there is no errors, that should become your first set of information. But most of the computer scientists I've seen they work on bad data. So, you know, we used to have a joke at the Institute of Science that, <clears throat> you know, biophysicists work with high precision machine on dead molecules and microbiologists and biochemists work on life cells with bad precision. <laughs> okay. So this is exactly the situation. You are supplier of data, you give the data. The other guy with all sophisticated computing and equations and turning it around. Sorry. I have seen, I have done last five, six years. Why? Many years. Data, data, data. You know, our Indian genome variation data was one of the biggest data those days. Every data has to be captured correctly. Every information has to be correct. And so data, data curation, you have to clean it up. If there are errors, you have to clean it up. Your data set becomes, you know, I started with 5.4 crore, 54 million data of uh, Ayurvedic data, right? But then I cleaned it up to 657,000 data. Then each data set has a subset of data which is complete on this analysis. But they are still very big. Like somebody asked me about diabetes. I can tell you we had looked at 100,000 diabetic patients and 100,000 obesity. We curated the data and we could bear their age profile. And I can tell you, the guys who are today, younger generation obese, are moving to diabetes at a five to 10 years later. It is so obvious. So now if you can put a sensors on them and put this and their exercise, then you can prevent the data shift. We don't have an individual longitudinal data, but curated data was very clear that you see the graph of the age profile of the uh, obesity, and you see the age profile of the diabetes. This was very, very clear. We published this, I can send you the reference, but this is high quality curation. I can tell you, it was a challenge to curate 
54 million to half a million, you know, little <laughs> over about a million. It was a challenge. So, like, if this curation reports are associated with the data, then I think, like, as Professor Chandrasekhar said, that one year time goes in literature survey, and similarly in the AI, like, yeah, one year time goes in the collection of right data. So, you know, I can tell you one thing as a professor of Indian Institute of Science and subsequently director of IGIB, I have handled many students, you know, when you have a 158 author paper and you don't want to retract it, how do you handle it? So I discovered one very interesting thing, to figure out inconsistencies in the information. So if you can write algorithms, which I use my brain to find inconsistencies, I say, hey, hey, there is some problem. So all my students, I make sure that whenever they give a data to me, I keep that old record. I don't like digital. I say, no, no, I want hard copy. Then next month they will say, no, last time hard copy, you showed me this, now you are not showing me this. Then say, sir, actually that time, you know, we did not have this feed. Ah, I said, okay. Again, keep hard copy. So I keep hard copy trades, 158 co-author people, okay? All data. You know, during this COVID, I have disposed 300 kgs of paper. They are all my hard copy trail of his data. Because without soft copy, you will tell. Then you have to make a maintain a log. So the log has to be very clear that all data changes will be recorded. You know, it's done in clinical trials, very, very carefully done, but they are very expensive softwares to kill so uh, Same link. So it's important that uh, data, data, otherwise, how do you make sure that the errors are not built in by students when you're working with so many students? So you have to make, come up with mechanisms. Great, I think Dr. Mudkavi has uh, come back again. Uh, Anybody else? Yeah, uh, the last question of the day is there, sir, from uh, uh, Dr. Majumdar. Where is he? Let me see. Dr. Majumdar, can you please Hi. unmute yourself? Yeah, he's there, sir. Oh, yeah. Yes. I'm Shantan. I'm a uh, faculty at RRI. So, RRI. Uh, thanks, Professor Brahmachari, for uh, very, very interesting and informative talks, uh, and all the panelists for very stimulating discussions. So my question is uh, along the same line uh, as the previous question. So particularly, like if we want to understand some trend in uh, uh, rural population where the data is very sparse and there is a lot of difficulty to crank up the volume of the data. So uh, my question is what kind of uh, efforts uh, are being taken up uh, so that uh, based on a parts data, we get a reliable trend like based on modeling and all. Uh, like you talked about the uh, like correcting the data and like how to uh, uh, based on big data, but uh, where the data is sparse, I think, uh, can you enlighten us about some of the efforts? Yeah, you know, if you follow Malanabish methods of statistics, then sampling, depending on how good sampling you have done. And the presently we are doing all uh, COVID antibody survey going on. Mm -hmm. There are sampling models are there. You use those models to do epidemiology. You don't cover anybody, everybody. You may say 16% of Bangalore is having antibody. It's a it's a extended, you know, you do a simple survey. You know, whereas 57% uh, in Dharabi has antibody, whereas 16% in Bombay uh, apartments. So depending on how you uh, how you design your uh, survey. Uh, my suggestions will be because we have, a, especially in India, we have such a large socio-economic variability, cultural variability. It's important to collect as much data. So I have also a model how to collect data. You know, our socially useful projects, SUWP school does, is actually not great. Can we use school children, high school children, actually give them projects to collect data? Okay. And if we can use them, you know, so use medical students, use engineering students, depending on what data you want. You want the soil quality data. You know, today India has uh, entire soil card. It's okay. All entire country's soil card is there. 
right? That is the five samples from, you know, uh, is taken and taken into a soil card with all 11 parameters, all the chemicals that is available. Of course, it would be wonderful to have metagenomic information to know how many, what type of nitrogen fixing bacteria are there. Now, but you, we have, ISRO gives us satellite of biomass available, okay, in a field. So we can say productivity. But it's not true. There can be a wheat straw, biomass may be large, but actual number of weeds may be small, right? So therefore, if we use our school children, college children, to collect as a research project to this data, so they go one meter by one meter, they pick up wheat and then calculate weight, and that's your practical, and mm -hmm. upload the data through mobile because they're smart now. Then we will collect real-time data, okay? This real-time data, we can be able to do only by involvement of people. So that's why one of our efforts of EPOC is uh, take the village to children, 12th class, class, educate them four months in medical things, two months made them practice in the district hospital, mm -hmm. put them back as an entrepreneur to capture data and send data into the central service system. And they get remunerations based on the number of data points they're collecting, number of people they're serving, so these are models, you know, these are new, new models that can be obtained. You know, I, I can tell you one thing. I run a very interesting uh, charitable trust. I was the chairman education commission of Bengal. So after my retirement, so I learned that the, Beng the rural Bengal has a very poor availability of teachers. You know, 200 students, two teachers teaching all subjects, all class. So how do you do? How do you do? So we created what is called a cloud-based telephony system through IVR. And 10,000 students have already got benefit out of it. At this moment, live, over seven, 8,000 students are using it. During COVID time, it was very much useful. We launched it in Faridabad, in Hindi also. So the student actually, rural children call, and the call comes to the IVR. IVR decides a teacher who is available housewives, retired teachers, professionals sitting in Calcutta, in Bengali, or it is in Haryana, in Hindi, and the call goes. But what I collect is the conversation. Then I collected analytics. Based on analytics, I can say which are the most curious students in government schools in Haryana. And then the, we can decide, you know, Faridabad Education Council says they will give awards and incentives. Then we run what is the average call duration which teacher has taken maximum call, which student is asking question in which call, right? Which chapter is a problem? I can tell you all, logarithm for class 9, 10 is a big problem. Class 7, 8, students don't understand logarithm. So then we can we create a logarithm video clip or voice uh, WhatsApp for school children to learn? You know, I run that charitable trust. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I formed it. And so it's, it's remarkable. It's all data. Rural data flowing in, and I my argument is, uh, tomorrow's brilliant scientists are into going to be in rural Bengal, rural Tamil Nadu, rural Kerala. Uh, don't expect them in Bangalore, Calcutta, Mumbai. So therefore, how do you pick them up? How do you search them? How do you pick them up and then make them uh, support them to become a good scientist? So you know your scientific curiosity measurement is not your mass, right? Yeah. These kids will make a difference. So how do we engage these thousands and thousands of students to do something to collect data? And that data that nation can utilize to make, uh, make decisions. Like, you know, rainwater. You know, IMD is giving you. Water is flowing through the river. Can we not ask students to measure in the local river water flow? What is there? Throw a stick. See how long it's taking. Calculate the volume. Measure the depth. This becomes a practical project. But they are collecting data. They are collecting data month by month how water flows. And that can help us to decide whether we should have a canal there, we should reserve it there. All sorts of decisions. It's all data-driven decisions. Risk infinite research. According to me, a citizen science for data generation is the future. I work with the University of Paris at CRE where we focus on citizen science. You know, I am their advisor, international board. And, uh, you know, India, we don't look at all these possibilities. You know, if I tell all these people, they'll think, 
oh, it's crazy, will not happen. Yes, it will happen in the West first and then come to India. But we have the resources of students. And OSDT is an example how students don't charge. They are free. They are happy to participate. I can tell you, you can take initiative and create 100,000 students. Look at uh, Technopedia by uh, Anil Gupta of IIM Ahmedabad. How projects of these students have been put. So you just look at it and ask, rural road, can I use the engineering students of civil engineering to evaluate rural roads? and collect data on the field, not that politician gets the information from the district officer. This is real possibility. And young people are honest. Young people are not politically, you know, they have a political view, but they are honest people. So you let the more young people collect data, the more authentic is the data. And more senior officers and bureaucratic system you want, you will get all sorts of data. You will think everything is fine in India. Nothing is wrong anywhere. All roads are built. So my suggestion is connect to younger students, schools, high school students, college students, collect data. Thanks a lot. Uh, thank so you. Good, uh, idea actually. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I think we are done with all the people whom we had called in. Uh, I, I, I think we can now close the session. Uh, we have spent close to three hours. It's not yeah, enough yes. with uh, Professor Brahmachari. I know that. I know, like, you know, the, we can go on and on. Uh, I thought it was worth the trouble of hearing him for one more hour extra uh, <laughs> by way of questions and answers. But I can tell you, you had 339 people to start with, and now it's 308. <laughs> no, no, no. So, <laughs> people so far. No, 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 but still held 292 more people. Like, you know, not a problem. Okay. <laughs> that was for three hours. Right. So thank you very much. And I think I'll just uh, give the floor back to the organizing committee uh, for formal closing session. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was very entertaining. I enjoyed three hours. You know, these days I don't travel. I don't go and attend meetings. But cyberspace, interacting with all of you was very, very enjoyable. Thank you for all your nice words. And thanks, Mutkavi, for your uh, excellent organization, Satanarayana. I hope we will meet in Bangalore as soon as I arrive. And uh, that's it. Thank you very much. For, for, for formal closure, please. Once again, I think uh, we are running too short of time now. So I'll just say a big thank you to Professor Brahmachari. Thank you to everyone here and then whom we cannot see, audience, for making this uh, lively as well as a lovely, I would say, lecture. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Thank you. Mm -hmm.